Hey guys, how are you? I pray that you're having an amazing day. Please forgive this camera if it's looking a little bit weird. I'm trying to figure it out myself. Um, it's been way past time for me to upgrade. I have a I have a better camera. It's all about just getting that baby connected. Um, I think I did hire Geek Squad to come out. They tried to connect one camera I had purchased and it wasn't working. And then I have another camera that they ended up hooking up, but I have got to put it back up over here. We're having, so I'm still using this Logitech. So do forgive me because I noticed that it was a little bit blurry on today. Do me a favor. Be sure to like, be sure to share. I believe that this lesson is needed, necessary, important, and vital. I believe that it's going to change your life. Um, this is for those of you who take the time out to hear and to do. You know, don't just be hearers of the word. The Bible tells us to be doers. Don't just be hearers. That is to say that that is a problem in the body of Christ is that we have a lot of hearers. We have a lot of people that can quote scripture. We have a lot of people that can get up and do the huckabuck, you know, whenever uh, this, whenever they start hitting the chords at church and all this other stuff. We have a lot of people that know how to get up and they know how to throw their back out and run around the church and do all of that other stuff. But application seems to be the problem for the average believer. You know, it's not about just hearing it. Is about um, applying it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you guys. I pray that you have had an amazing week. So typically I go live on Wednesdays. Yeah, Wednesdays or Thursdays. But I didn't go live because I had a really, 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 really busy week. Um, but I decided tonight I'm going to still do it. At first I was thinking, you know what, we're just going to have to go a week without it. But I'm like, no, I'm going to do this lesson on tonight and then tonight and then I'm going to, God willing, come out and do my Sunday lesson tomorrow. If I don't do the Sunday lesson tomorrow, it'll be Monday. Either way, I'm going to make sure I'm giving you guys at least two lessons a week. Um, one of my objectives is to start trying to give you something pretty much every day, but I won't go live every day, if that makes sense. One of the things that I'm, I'm praying that I get into, that I do want to get into, is giving you guys, like, during the week, our Wednesday lessons will be like these, you know, uh, the, the middle week lessons will be, you know, extensive, uh, Sunday lessons, extensive, but during a week, like 20 minute lessons and stuff like that. I would love to take the time out to do that. I know that nine times out of 10, I would have to sit down on a Saturday or Sunday and just record it. And then I would come out and share it with you guys. I'm just giving you a little bit of small talk um, as you guys come into the room. Um, again, do me a favor, like and share, like and share today. I'm going to be dealing. Now, hear me. Once I tell you what the topic is, what we're going to be dealing with, I need you to commit in your heart not to run out of here. I need you to commit in your heart not to run out of here because a lot of times I've, I've told you guys before, a lot of times we are very selective and a lot of times we select the messages that we don't need. We select the things that, you know, tickle our ears or what have you, but you run out, of, you run, run out on the substance, you run out on meat, you run out on things um, that address you, that confront you, you run out on things like that. So one of the things that I want to make sure that you don't do is that when you hear me tell you we're about to deal with this devil called idolatry, that you don't try, you don't take off running and say, well, I'm not an idol worshiper or I've heard enough lessons on idolatry. I don't feel like I need to hear about idolatry. No, we're not here talking about, you know, how to get a man or what have you. That, that, that's good. That's revelatory. And we will talk about that probably this week or what have you. I'm saying that to say, let's be mature believers. Let's make sure that we are here. Um that we are here to get the word and we're not just running around looking for messages that appeal to our lust or what have you. And that's what we're going to be dealing with all today. Thank you guys. Um, we're going to be dealing with this topic of idolatry again. I don't know why my camera looks so blurry. I was trying to figure it out before I went live. I don't know why it looks so blurry, but I'm going to eventually have to just go ahead and invest in a system um, that works. I'm going to have to invest in something a lot better than this or what have you. So y'all just stay on my case about that. All right. So we're going to be dealing with the topic of idolatry. I'm going to be sharing with you what God shared with me. I'm going to be sharing with you. I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to be open. I believe that what you're going to get from today's lesson is going to not, not necessarily just convict you, but it's going to give you the tools that you need to make the adjustment. It's going to give you the tools that you need to make the change. I'm thinking about one of my, um, my sister in Christ, she was over my house. With, she was over my house doing my hair. She has a company uh, called Mobile Beauties where they do hair. And she had uh, brought her daughters over to the house with her. And, you know, the daughters are, are small. And one of the daughters was going, you know, going through some stuff. She's like nine years old. So she was going through some, some stuff with a friend. And I was just talking to her. And her mom was like, Tiffany, you know, you, 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 you forget that's a nine year old. And uh, <laughs> she was like, you forget that's a nine year old. 
She said, I'm trying to give it to her more palatable. And I was like, no, you have to give it to these kids direct. They're smarter than you think. Oh, what have you? So I was telling her, you got to give it to them a little bit more direct because I was telling the little girl, hey, this is this this is a spirit. That's a spirit. What you want to do, you know, you want to be careful on this type of stuff. And, you know, the kids looking at me like, OK, you know what kids do? And she's like, no, I try to lead her. And I told her, I said, no, realistically speaking, I said, everybody wants direction. Most of the time, we don't want to be led to a, a space where you're like, OK, I've given you enough. So now you get to make a decision. I said, most of the time, yes, we want you to lead us. We don't want you to control us. I said, but most of the times, you know, people are looking for instruction. And they want you to say, hey, go left instead of right. Now, you got the choice. I'm not going to be mad at you if you if you go uh, right instead. I'm not going to be mad at you. But if I were you, if I were you, this is the decision that I would make. If I were you, what have you? So a lot of times we're looking for that. We're looking for somebody to give us revelation. Um, or what have you? It's not blurry. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get into this lesson. I wanted to get like 200 people on here before we get started, but it is what it is. We're going to get started, and we're going to get something out of this as soon as I tell my dog to get up on this couch. Go up, up, go up, so we don't hear the pitter patter of puppy feet. Go up, good boy, because he likes to march around my table, and I don't know why he just does that. Oh, what have you? She was laughing at me yesterday, too, because my dog is nine years old. And he's gotten to the pl place where I told him concerned. I got to take him to the vet because what he does now is he groans when he lays down. I said, he, you know, he, 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 he this song coming from his soul. He would go, and he did that. And she started laughing. I said, she's like, yeah, I see. Yes, he's been doing that. I said, he get up here. Rrr. And I'm like, my baby, I, I can't. It's, it's a lot or what have you, but I do want to take him to the vet. It could be him just relaxing or what have you. She said she believed he, he got it from me because I make sounds sometimes when I'm, you know, moving or I'm, I'm, she said he probably got that for me. All right, let's go ahead and get into this lesson. Let's go ahead and get into this lesson. We're going to be dealing with the topic of idolatry. Again, I need you to be mature on today. Don't run away from the topics of idolatry or what have you, because this may be the thing that's holding you back. And I believe that what God is going to share with you today is going to give you what you've been asking for. I need somebody out here in these virtual streets to hear me. Sometimes your issue is you keep selecting what messages you want to listen to. You keep selecting what you feel is revelatory towards you. And you keep eating the same thing. And it's not making a change in your life because you don't have a balanced diet. So I'm saying this to say, don't run from messages of, of holiness and correction. Don't run from messages where you can get that revelation. Because sometimes you're asking God for something and he gives you the answer. But because it's not coming in the format that you want it to come in, then you're like, oh, that ain't for me. So this is just a little bit of revelation, a little bit of insight. Um, I do believe that this is the answer to many of your, you guys' prayers. Genuinely, wholeheartedly, I'm not just saying that. I do believe that what I'm about to share with you is the answer to your prayers. Your answer to your prayers, if you say, God, I want a husband, I want a wife, I want a house, I want this reality, I want that reality. The answer to your prayers is not to give you a husband or a wife. The answer to your prayers is to give you the revelation of who you are, give you a revelation of God, who he is. And that way you can seek him out, be content in him. And then all of these things be added to you. There, I want you to hear me. The more you chase God, things start to be attracted to you. So if you go off the path and you chase money, money will take up wings and fly away. This is the Bible. The money will take up wings and fly away. Anything you chase will run. Somebody put that in the chat. Anything you chase will run. But when you start to chase God, um, thank you, Sister Alicia. I love you. When you start to chase God, when you start making God your number one, when you start making God your everything, when you clear out your peripheral, right, everything else becomes a blur because you start focusing just on God. When he becomes the center, the apple of your eye, the center of your attention, everything else that's attracted to God starts to chase you because you're chasing him. I'm telling you, you'll get, I'm telling you, if you listen to this and you apply it, this, you will see a change in your life. Everything that you want, everything that you've ever thought of comes after the content version of you. It comes after the version of you that's chasing God. It comes after the version of you that sits back and says, wealth and riches. Hey, thanks for coming along on the journey. Oh, hey, boo thing. Thank you for joining me on the journey because all of you are chasing God. I'm giving you revelation. Everything, money chases God. Everything that everything in this earth chases God. Even demons chase God, right? They chase him. They, they go after him, but he's cast him out of their, his presence. And so now they try to get into us because they so desperately, they want him. 
but they know they can't have him. But at the same time, they want their own thing as well. So I'm saying it to say that what I'm about to teach you today is going to help you. If you apply it, you listen, you take it to heart and take the time out. Share this with somebody that, you know, can benefit from it or what have you. But let's get in start. Let's get started. The Greek word for idolatry is idolatria, and it means image worship. And idolatria, for those of you who want the spelling, E-D-I-O-L-O-T-R-I-A, E-I-D-O-L-O-T-R-I-A, and it means image worship. It means to worship an image or worshiper of images, first false gods. Idol worship literally means the worship of an image, the worship of an image. You remember God says casting down imaginations, where imagination comes from image. In your imagination, you see pictures. You don't see words in your mind. You see pictures. And so what we do is when we see a picture, we translate it to words, right? So I may sit up there and think about, I'm going to this ball. And I, I may look at a dress or I may imagine myself in a dress and I say, I don't know why I want a green dress. I don't know why I, I want. And so I would imagine myself maybe in something green, long sequence, flare. Oh, what have you? I imagine myself in that dress. And so now I'm seeing an image of that dress in my head. Once I see the image of that dress, then I go online and I start typing in the details of what I'm seeing. I'm not going to see words that come up in my head. I'm going to see an image. And then I'm going to start to uh, translate what I'm saying. Everything you do, you are a translator. You are always translating what you see. And so God says casting down images or casting down imaginations because some of the images that come up in your mind are from the dark one, from the evil one. They come from your voice. They come from a place of void, a place of hurt. Now, a void is an empty space in the soul. We've talked about that. It is a dark spot in your soul that is empty of God because God is light. So a void is nothing but a black abyss in your soul. This is the reason why I can't be satisfied. It is a bottomless pit in your soul. You can have a void in the daddy room. You can have a void in the mama room. You can have a void in different areas of your life. And so that's the area in which you're not satisfied and you cannot be satisfied because catch this, satisfaction is not the uh, way to address a void. Giving God his place is. Giving God his place is so wherever there's going to be a void, there's going to be demons in that space because demons live in, they dwell in darkness. So whenever there's a void, demons are going to come into that space. And what demons will do is they'll start to tell you or they'll start lying to you about what is needed to satisfy that area of your life. What is it that you need to make you feel better about your situation? What is it that you need? So typically, you may cast an image of a man, for example. So you start imagining a man. And then what other boys are going to start talking about? Uh, what it is that you feel like you need in a man based on what you had in your ex, what you didn't have in your ex, what you had in your daddy, what you didn't have in your daddy. And, you know, and based on what, what, what's going on in your life, all of these are going to come together to create a bunch of voices that are going to come. So you may say, I need my man to be uberly masculine. And for myself personally, I do. I prefer a masculine dude. But, you know, I need, my, I need my dude to be masculine. Let me just kind of stop here and let me say this. Me and my sister in Christ, we were talking about this. I don't know if I should say this out loud. I think this is a female conversation. I think this is a personal friend conversation or what have you. So I'm just going to pass over that. Uh, but I will say this. I will say this. I won't leave y'all on the branch. We were talking about this and we were laughing about it. And, you know, talking about, you know, we we're talking about how most women prefer a masculine man. I said, but most of the time there has to be some type of balance because typically when a man is overly masculine, he ain't that bright. <laughs> he ain't that bright. I say he'd be good with working, doing all this other stuff, but a lot of times he may not be that bright. You know, whenever you do come across a man who's uberly masculine and he's intelligent, that is a rare case or what have you. And he's gonna be wiped up and he's gonna have that married man belly, that married man's belly, because somebody's gonna hurry up and feed that joker. But anywho, moving on. When it comes down to images, the enemy is always trying to put an imagination in your mind. The enemy is always trying to tell you, okay, so you need your man to be like this 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 and that so you need him to be uberly masculine you need him to make uh six figures you know he needs to be a workaholic you want somebody to work with, with his hands uh you want somebody who's super protective over you you want somebody who you know he's this and he's that so your imagination what it's doing or those voids are starting to talk it's what it's doing is it's putting together an impossibility y'all y'all please don't be quiet on me tonight don't do that to me don't don't do that to me what your imagination will do is put together uh, and a possibility. What happens in your soul? The enemy will put together an impossibility. And what I mean by this is, yes, does a man like that exist? Probably. Are you going to meet that man? Nine times out of ten, no. 
Nine times out of ten, though, the, it, what it does is it puts together in your mind an impossibility. This way, by the time the right person comes your way, you're not looking for who he is or who she is to my brother. Instead, what you do is you find yourself looking for the, this image in your mind. What the enemy does, because I'm, I'm giving you the secrets of hell. I'm giving you the secrets of darkness. What the enemy does is he will let you constantly be disappointed based on the list that you made in your mind. And this list is based on your voice, based on your brokenness, based on what you don't have and what you need from God only. Only God can fill a void. The enemy will put this list of impossibilities in your mind. And then once he puts that list of impossibilities, he will start to attack you with disappointment. Please don't. Y'all too quiet on me tonight. Y'all make me want to go. But he will attack you with disappointment. OK, he will attack you with disappointment. So you meet a guy. Dang. He was masculine. But the dude didn't have the sense of three spiders put together. They put their brains together. This, that's not a, the sense. He had. this dude, he wasn't that bright. Or I, I met somebody. He wasn't openly masculine. He was really intelligent. But you know what? He had a little switch in his hip. He had a little bit of, you know, it was a little bit of a little bit of sugar up in there that I, that I wasn't too fond of. Then I met this guy. So what ends up happening is I'm trying to show you. It causes you to settle. The objective is to settle because the enemy will he specializes in disappointment. After you have been disappointed time and time again, the enemy then sends somebody who is good enough. The enemy then sends somebody who is good enough. So what I'm saying is that. Somebody comes along and he checks off four items on your list of 10. Everybody else was a deficit or they had one item. But here comes somebody that checks off four or five items and you see the red flags. You will ignore the red flags because, dang, I haven't met nobody that 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 held up this much. You know, I, I've, I've talked to these many dudes this year, but this guy, he's masculine. He got a good job. You know, he go to church, but, you know. He go to a false, uh, he, he go to a false church. Like, you know, it's false doctrine there. It's not, a, but you know, but they do believe in Jesus. So that's good enough. Right. Ishmael, the enemy always will have you specializing in good enough. So image worship, the enemy will use that void to create an image in your mind. And I tell you every time the, the thing with the divorce, the thing is you're married to the image. You're not married to the person. The majority of times in the United States of America, you're not, when you go down that aisle, especially to the woman, I'm, I, I got to keep it real with you. Man, a man will marry who you are, not who you're becoming. Women, we have a tendency to marry who you're becoming or who we think you have the potential to become. But then when you don't get there and we don't see you trying to get there, then we start falling back. So a lot of times men don't want you to change. I like you as you is. I don't know what the complaint is. I don't, I don't know what you complain about. Women, on the other hand, have a tendency to complain about you got so much potential. You could do this. You could, you could, you could listen, you can climb mountains. Matter of fact, you can move mountains with your words. You got so much potential in you. We have a tendency to fall in love with the image that we see in our minds. We have a tendency to fall in love with the image. And we end up dealing with perpetual disappointment because we keep seeing this dude show up as he is and not how we know he has the potential to become. So idolatry, it comes from the Greek word al idolatria and it means image worship it is the worship of an imagination and the worship of an image this is why god says casting down imagination just before i move on one of the things i will tell you is be careful and i'm especially talking to the sisters be careful what you do with your head be careful what you do with your mind when you meet a man most of the times y'all get mad at these men you are here talking about him trying to destroy him and you're frustrated with him not because of something he said to you, but because of the image you created in your mind. And if you go to a man, if I go to a man and I'm like, you all strong and stuff. Now, he could, this dude could be weak. Right. But if I have that image in my mind, if I've imagined him because I got to watching, you know, something on TV and the man was strong and now my man looks like he built forward tough and what have you. And I imagine him strong and I imagine him carrying me away in the midst of gunfire and and and, and an explosion of of bullets and stuff like that. And I'm just, I'm looking, I'm like, you're so strong. A man gonna be like, thank you, Miss E. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. I, I love you, sis. A man's gonna carry me. He, he, what he's gonna do, he'll be like, thank you. He gonna go along with it because that's what you want. He's gonna go along with it. And so end up with what I've seen with women repeatedly 
is one, you don't take accountability. I'm sorry, I got to tell it to you, keep it to you real. Two, the problem is you sit back and you get so excited about the image. You keep telling the man who you need him to be, what you want him to be. And then when he doesn't become that, you actually feel betrayed. Tell me if I'm lying. You feel like he, he, he got over on you. He ran game on you. He played with your mind. He lied to you. He deceived you. No, he didn't. You deceived yourself. Yeah, yeah, okay, you ain't got to talk to me. You deceived yourself because of the image you put in your mind. This has been a pattern of yours. If I can get you to take accountability, I can get you not to go back through that same thing again. You deceived yourself. That man didn't tell you that he was strong. That man didn't tell you he was a good provider. That man didn't tell you this or they tell you that. He just let you tell him who you thought he was. He let you get caught up or what have you. All he did was say, you tripping. <laughs> No, you know what I'm saying? No, I, I want to have three kids. I want to have that. You filled in the blanks. You filled in the blank. And then now you turn around and get mad at him because at the end of the day, he is nothing like the image that you created. The, in the Hebrew, there are several words for the word. There are several words uh, for idol. One is alil, E-L-I-L, -L, and it means false god, worthless. Hear me when I say that every idol that you have is worthless, meaning it has no power. It has no value. Now, a person, if you idolize a person, obviously that person has value to God. But what it is that you're looking for in that person, you're not going to extract from that person. Um, I come from a family of idol worshipers and I struggle with it myself. And um, it's really strong as a generational issue. And one of the ways that God has dealt with me when, when it comes down to idol worship is he let me constantly deal with disappointment. If I put somebody on a pedestal, God would allow that person to disappoint me to the perfect point where it would hurt me really bad. Like it would hurt me. And I would feel I didn't like the way that felt. And I hated, you know, feeling so frustrated, so upset or what have you. I hated that feeling. And I got to the space where I don't want to feel this again. And when I said, I don't want to feel this again, then God gave me that image. God says, okay, I'm going to show you how not to feel this again. What you're going to have to do is put your hope in me. What you're going to have to do is get delivered from esteeming people. What, what I need you to do is love people from where they are, not where you need them to be, where you want them to be, because everything that you need is in me. Everything that you need is in me. And so what you're looking for in people, I will let them disappoint you. I will let them not be able to satisfy you. I will let them sit. I will let you sit there and go through all that building and showing off all 32 of your pearly white, 31 because they took one uh, last year, but all 31 of your pearly whites. I'll let you go through all of that. But at the end of the day, you won't get what you're looking for. This, this, is, this is the same thing that's happening to many of you. You're not getting what you're looking for because you're looking for something that only God can give you. Or even if they have the ability to, to, to give, to give you what you want. Sometimes God will lay it on her. God won't allow you to get from your idol because what God wants you to do, he wants you to come right back to him. Half of the arguments, half of the fights, half of the stuff that goes on that both, thank you, God bless you. Uh, but half of the fights, half of the arguments, half of the disappointments, divorce, you know, I want a divorce, all that stuff. Half of that stuff comes from the image in your mind. You getting mad because you got two different people. You got the image in a person sitting in front of you and you're mad because the person in front of you is not th this that you got in your head. And that, that what you that's in your head is the impossibility. The enemy creates that image because the, the enemy knows you will never meet somebody that has every last one of those things that you feel like you need. The enemy knows that. So the enemy is going to put that impossibility in your head. That way you will keep looking for that. And the next thing you know, you're in another relationship. Now you feel deceived. And now you're like these men, these men, these women, these women out here. No, it ain't the people. The issue is God wants you perpetually satisfied in him. He wants you. He wants you so satisfied in him that you can look at a person from a place of, Hey, how are you? Let me see if you can be of any blessing to my life because I have everything that I need. So I got to make sure that you're not a deficit. I got to make sure that you're not a deficit. Getting back to it. In Hebrew, there are several words, five um, actually, uh, for the word idol. The first one, of course, we're talking about alil, E-L-I-L, -L, which is false, false god or worthless. Number two, teraphim. T-E-R-A-P-H-I-M, teraphim. And it means family idol, household God. 
family idol, house, household God. This is, this is the generational issue. Number three, what is this? Pesel, P-E-S-E-L. And it means carved image, graven image, carved idol. We'll talk about that, no worries, guys. But carved image, graven image, carved idol, something made with the hands. Number four, Masika, which means molten image, molten image or molten idol, something that's been melted down and created. And then five, last one, a ven, a ven, A-V-E-N, it means iniquity, vanity. These are the Hebrew words for idol. Kanisha, you're beautiful. Thank you, sis. God bless you. God bless you. All right, so I'm going to give you five types of idol based on this list that I just gave you. Five types of idols. Number one, hope you're writing this stuff down, idols of the heart. Idols of the heart. These are the images. These are the imaginations. The Bible told you to cast down. I told you whatever you don't cast down will ultimately have to be cast out. Idols of the heart. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. One of the things I tell you, one of the ways that you, you escape the idolatry of humans, right, is stop attaching a personality. Like, don't animate their will in your head. So, for example, if I'm talking to a guy, because this is what every woman has done at some point in her life, or the majority, 99.8%, 99.9%, if not 100% of women. We have a tendency to animate people in our head. So I may talk to a guy and then I get out the phone with him and I'm animating him. I'm thinking about us going on vacation and we're off in Europe somewhere and we're holding hands and we're up at the, the Eiffel Tower. I don't even want to say the Eiffel Tower because Eiffel Tower is kind of boring. But, we, you know, we, we, we're going through all these different places. We're, we're on the ferries in Italy, and it's just all romantic. And we're, So I can animate that in my mind, and I, get, I fall in love with the image. I fall in love with the image. Turn around, and I'm telling him, you know, I, I, I was thinking about, I want to I travel with you. And he's like, yeah, traveling sounds good. But I don't know that I'm dealing with somebody that really don't care to travel. Uh, I may be dealing with somebody who is a... Um, he, he's local, local, meaning he stays within the community. His family stays in that community. None of, none of them have bro broken the curse of not traveling. He ain't trying to go nowhere. You talk about cruise ship. He say Titanic. He ain't getting on nobody's cruise ship. You say flight. He said no nope, feet staying on solid ground and what have you. So he sits back and he's talking or what have you. And he's entertaining my fantasy, right? He's entertaining my fantasy. Then I turn around and I get with him and I marry him. And I'm like, um, so we got some money coming in and, you know, I was thinking we can go, I ain't going on no cruise ship. Babe, what are you talking about? I, I told you I wanted us to, I wanted us to sail away off into the sea and all of that stuff. And now he's sitting up there and now I'm, I'm now I'm mad. Now I'm hurt. Now I'm disappointed because he didn't match the image. He didn't match the image. I told you, use your crazy for creativity. All those imaginations that you have, write a book from it, right? Imagine the stuff that comes out of your voids. Listen. The stuff, it, 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 it entangles itself with your creativity. Anyhow, write a book. Some of the craziest and some of the most popular books come out of, come out of madness. It comes out of the madness of the mind. Sister Sophia, thank you. God bless you, beautiful. It comes out of the madness of the mind. The stuff that you, 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 you thought of that made you laugh, made you angry, made you sad, made you question yourself, is the madness of the mind. Take it and write a book from it. When we talked about types of idol, idols of the heart. These are the images that, that, that post up in your mind and now they become a part of your heart. They're no longer just images that come in that you can cast down, but they're, not, they're now in the heart, which means they have to actually be addressed, right? Number two, generational idols. These are the idols that were passed down in your family. Generational idol in my family was marriage. And so the whole concept of being single in Mississippi, <laughs> a young woman single, you ain't got no man yet. Girl, you ain't getting no younger. And you better do this to hold on to that man. We were taught to hold on. Hold on to that. Girl, don't you let nobody take your man. We were taught that. So we were taught generational idols. Consequently, as a kid, I remember my mom, she would always hold relationships over my head, even when I wasn't thinking about a man. I remember my mom telling me as a kid, because, you know, I'm at that stage where I was playing with dolls and stuff. My mom saying don't no man want a woman that can't cook 
So then she took me into the kitchen and I remember standing on a chair and I remember we were living on Solomon Street. When we lived on Solomon Street, I was five to six years old. We moved every year. And so that's how I know the age I was at every stage. So I remember standing on a chair and stirring food at five to six years old. I remember helping my mom to peel or they call them shut greens. I remember they were, my mom would buy garbage bags full of greens from people, you know, that worked in a field or what have you. I remember two things that would come out of those bags that used to be terrifying wasp and stink bugs. I remember it, you know, my mom pulling stuff out of it. And sometimes that bag and my mom, I would be sitting on the floor when I'm chucking. My mom would be sitting above me on the couch. And I remember, you know, I'm having to duck my mom's leg or walls come out or a, spring, a, a stink bug come out. And we both trying to get up out of there. Both of us trying to save our lives, right? But number three was Purcell uh, carved image. Oh, we were past that. Purcell carved image. But we're talking about types of idols, idols of the heart, number one. Number two, generational idols. These are idols that go in the bloodline. In my bloodline, it was marriage. And so God has had me single now. March is going to make 10 years. March will make 10 years of me being single. Yeah, March will make 10 years of me being abstinent. Almost 11 years of me being single. But in my ex and myself broke up in December of 2013. Yeah. So it'll be almost, it would be 10 years of me being single. 10 years of me being single and absent. 10 years of me being single and absent. But generational idols. Number three. Idols made with hands. Idols made with hands. Things that you buy, girl. Did you see this or did you see that? You know, I, I just painted this picture. That's my Mona Lisa. There's nothing wrong with being creative or what have you. But at the same time, you don't want to esteem things. I, I, I can honestly say one of the idols that are made with hands today. And I, this is going to hit some of my brothers in their throat. And I got to love you enough to tell you the truth. Video games. Video games. Video games are... The side chicks of today. Am I telling the truth? They're the, they're the side chicks of today. The they take your attention. The time that you could be putting into your purpose, the time you could be putting into worship, the time you could be spending with your wife, the video game takes all of that. The video games are idols made with hands today, right? So there are different idols made with hands. Number four, idols erected in adversity. Idols erected in adversity. These are the idols that come whenever you're going through some stuff. Whenever you're sad, let's say if you're going through a financial attack and then all of a sudden some man comes out the blue and he's like, hello. And you find out that old boy making six figures or seven figures or what have you. Now you over here thinking that you'd have met your, your knight in shining armor because he's willing to help you out with your bills or what have you. But idols erected in adversity. Sometimes it can be um, a feeling that you get in adversity or something that you say in adversity. You know, I bet I'm not going to be like this no more or new me, new me. I'm, you know, I'm going to change and what have you. But these are things that typically spring forward whenever you're going through a storm. Idols erected in adversity. These become your false strong towers. Last one, last one, number five, spiritual idols. This is when you start worshiping things outside of the most high God in the universe. And you start talking about the universe. And you know what's crazy is that a lot of Christians are getting into that stuff. Like how you sit up there and read the Bible, read God say not to do it, and then you still turn around and do it. I come to understand when God says that they would do stuff to provoke them to, him to wrath. And I was like, who is crazy enough to try to intentionally pro provoke the most high God to wrath? And I realized it's people who deep down in their heart are angry with God. Deep down in their heart, when people are angry with God, they take it out on God's leaders nowadays. But realistically speaking, the anger that they have when they say church hurt is not toward a church. In many cases, it's an anger towards God. Y'all don't want me to talk about that. It's an anger towards God. I was going through something and they wasn't even helping me. Nobody was helping me in my church or what have you. Ain't like, what were you angry about? What were you going through? It was just a lot of stuff going on in my life. Okay. Maybelline, could have been you You got dumped by a dude that you were sleeping with. And you mad at the church because nobody would pray your idol back into your life. You mad at God because God wouldn't bring you your idol back. You mad at God because he would not bow down to your idol. You got the audacity to be mad at him because he delivered you from your idol. See, you, let me tell you a little bit of a secret. I don't know who needs to hear this. Because sometimes what y'all do is y'all bring your idol to church. You sit up there, you praying. When you get God involved, he going to deliver you. 
When you get God involved, he's going to deliver you. God, I don't know what's happening with Marquise. But Lord, I ask that you, you know, he, he's been doing a lot of stuff, God. And I love him. Set him free. And the first thing God says, okay, cool. And then God sets him free from you. And he sets you free from him. Deliverance takes place. And then you get mad at God for being God. You get mad because God is saying, you don't need him. He don't need you. I need him to focus on me just like I need you to focus on me. You're not mature enough. You're not healed enough. You're not ready for the thing that you've been praying for right now. And so whenever you ask me for something, I'm going to give it. But it comes in layers. Somebody say it comes in layers. It comes in layers, meaning if I say, God, I want to have the huge house and I, I want like five acres of land, God, and I want to have this and that. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, and I'm, I'm putting that before God. His promises are yea and amen. You know, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So, you know, that's, I ask for it. You know, you have not because you ask not. Do you think that what God's answer is going to be is somebody come up and say, here's the keys to your new property. Because <gasps> the problem that I learned that, sorry, uh, sorry, I love you, but I got to tell the truth. So y'all, my black sisters and brothers, the problem is you want somebody to hand something because you want to get in the boo sick because that's that victim's mentality. It comes from slavery. That victim's mentality. You want somebody to come hand you something. You, you don't want to go through a process. You don't want to be cut. You don't want to be delivered. You just want somebody to come and you want somebody to just hand it to you. And the way that God does is God starts to say, okay, you're asking me for a house. You're asking, okay, I'm not going to give you more than you can bear. You're asking me for this. And you're asking me for something that's 5,500 square foot. Your apartment now is 1,200 square foot and you can't even keep that clean. You can't even keep that clean. So you out here in these streets, and this is what gets you mad at God. You out here in these streets looking for somebody to give it to you. And God is looking because God wants you to give him glory, not a person. And so what God does, God takes you through a process of pruning. Why is these things not growing in you? Because heaven's on the inside of you. So God starts to prune. Okay. He starts to prune. He, he prune you of that friend. I don't know what's happened. I loved her, God. He pruned you of that man. He was like the last potential guy. He had like four things that I like, God. He prunes you of different things in your life. He prunes you of the reality. Then God, in the midst of all that, God has the audacity because he can have the audacity. It belongs to him. He has audacity to tell you, now I want you to go move here. And I want you to go do this. And you're like, how? How? He strips you before he adds to you. He adds, he takes from you before he adds to you. And most people don't survive the stripping. Because the, the delusion because, you know, you, you would do Lulu with, you would do Lulu with God before you would do Lulu with a dude. OK, the delusion is God's just going to hand it to you on top of your generational issues, your, your dysfunction, your perversion. God's just going to hand it to you. If God handed it to you right now, it will crush you. There's a lot of responsibility. Everything that's big and great comes with great responsibility. You want a million dollars? There's responsibility that comes with that. It's not just having a million dollars in your account. You, you're going to have a million dollars worth of problems. You're going to have a house that's going to be more expensive. You're going to have bills. You're going to have all of those things, which means you need more money coming in, which means there's a greater measure of responsibility. You got to have a greater measure of, of discernment because the more you enter into the minority, the more you enter into the minority, the more you have to deal with the majority. That means you become a rare thing and most people cannot understand you. Most people can't relate to you. The more you enter into the minority, the more the less like you are as it relates to the majority. God calls you out. He sends you out or what have you. And it can be really frustrating. But the, the last one was types of idols, spiritual idols. These are idols where you make a demon out of an idol. You make a feeling out of an idol. You make a reality out of an idol. These are the, the, the things that you feel like you need to get. But these are spiritual idols. 
An idol is anything. I'm going to give you a few definitions uh, for the word idol. Anything you esteem as equal to or greater than God. Now you can put in parentheses hierarchy. Anything you esteem as equal to. I love my kids, my man, and my guy. Idol. God is my world. He is my everything. I love God with all my heart, mind, and my strength. And you know what? Yes, if I'm married, I love my husband. Yes, I love my children. But you won't hear me sitting there and trying to put them in the same rim with one another. Because this is what happens when any time God strips you of that man, now you're mad at him because they were equal. Remember what uh, Lucifer said, I will be like the Most High God. He didn't say I will be greater than. He said I will be like. I will be on the same plane. I will be equal to. And anybody who desires to be equal to secretly, inwardly desires to be greater than. Anything you esteem as equal to or greater than God is an idol. Number two. Anything you put before God, and you can put in their chronology, you put in their prioritization, anything you put before God, I, 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 I just I just feel like I need to have this house, I need to have this, if I had the car, the house, the man, if I had all of that, then I'd be good. And God, you know, if you give me all that, I'm going to worship you like, hey, I'm going to worship you, I'm going I'm to I'm, I'm do the huckabuck. And God is like, why can't you do that without the stuff? Why do these things have to come first? Why is your worship to me only when you get a check in the mail that you wasn't expecting? Why? Why? And it, is that the reason why you only get a check in the mail that you weren't expecting when you're going through a hardship and it happens once every three years? Now you got testimony service at the church. You're testimony testifying about a reality or testifying about an event that God wanted to be your reality. He wanted you to live in abundance, but because you've made an idol out of things, God, there are things that God has to withhold from you. Things that he has to withhold from you. Not because he's trying to punish you, because you got to get delivered from that. It is not that he's trying to punish you. It's because he's trying to deliver you. Anything you put before God, any priority, I, you know, um, we in church, gosh, service is almost over with. Mm, pastor's going over. I really want to get home and watch this game. I came. Well, I'm going to stay a little bit later because I got to finish watching this game. Everything. Okay, prayer. I'm going to get to you, God, but let me finish watching TikTok a little bit longer. Everything that goes before God is an idol. Anything you prioritize above him is an idol. Number three, anything you fear more than God. You put it in parentheses, reverence. Anything you fear more than God. I tell you guys, if we had an issue in the United States of America where they came in and they said, you're going to have to bow, bow down to our God or die, most of you would sit up there and you go to hell trying to stay alive. You'd be all on your knees, getting your knees dirty for somebody else's God rather than sitting back and saying, you know what? I will not fear you. I fear the most high God. I'm a, I will not fear somebody who could destroy the body, but I fear the one who could destroy the soul in hell. I feel the one who can destroy the soul in hell. You ain't gonna have me going to hell. You know, trying to serve you or your gods. Anything you fear more than God. Anything and that's you put in parentheses reverence. Number four, anything you defend more than God. Anything you defend more than God is an idol. Anything you defend more than God. Somebody sit up there and you like, um, somebody says, hey, listen, your favorite celebrity. Somebody come out and say, you know. You sitting up here, y'all watching uh, Beyonce or uh, Jay-Z or anything like that, and you off in here, you're supposed to be a Christian, but you're defending them. You're defending them. You're supposed to be a Christian, but you're defending things. You got to in the church. Our problem isn't the world. The problem is people who identify themselves as Christians who are still a part of the world. That's where the issue comes in because you know just enough scripture to argue, but not enough. You have you don't have enough understanding to back your argument, so you can get followers based on your argument. I, I've been a Christian. I grew up a Christian. My daddy was a, a a bishop in the Lord's church. So, but you have knowledge. You have knowledge, but no understanding. Knowledge puffs up. You have knowledge, but you have don't have any, any understanding. And so now you can say, but well, then the Bible say judge. The Bible said we can righteous judgment. The Bible said judge ye not in that, that scripture is talking about hypocrisy. Don't judge somebody based on, don't judge somebody 
uh, in an area that you haven't gotten it together. But you can't judge righteously. All right. And idol is number five. Anything that has control over how you feel. What you do and how and how a season, a chapter or your life story ends. That's an idol. I'm going to say that again. Anything that has control over how you feel. He didn't speak to me this morning. He didn't do this and all that. And he called me back. They didn't text me back. And now I'm just, praise God. I hear him. Praise God. Give God glory. God woke you up. God did this. Why are you mad because a man didn't send you a good morning text? Anything that has control over how you feel, what you do, I ain't going to even go to church. I don't think I'm going to work today because, girl, I just, I'm not feeling good. So a man didn't text you back and now you don't want to go to work. Now you're sick. Now your stomach turning upside down. What you do and how a season, a chapter, or your life story ends is an idol. Anything that has that type of power over you is an idol. It, when, if it can control your choices, it can control your mind, your will, or your emotions. That's simplify it. If it can control your mind, the thoughts that's coming in, now you're dealing with depression the whole day, sadness the whole day, frustration the whole day, anxiety the whole day, and you're constantly checking your phone. If I text you, you you, you look at the phone, you're like, how do people keep texting me? Because you're looking for his text message, your mind, your will, the choices that you make. I'm going to go, I'm going to cut my hair off, and uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cut it off. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to rock a, a baby for him, I'm going to dye it blonde. And I'm gonna have a kid on there because I, 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 you know, I, I, and I'm gonna go get me some some contact lenses, and girl, I'm gonna go get me a waist trainer and all that stuff. Now you over here trying to do anything that you can to appeal to your idol and your emotions, how you feel. Anything that has that type of power to move your feelings can move your will. And now you over here depressed, sad, dealing with suicide ideation. That is an idol. That is an idol. All right. I want to, I'm going to introduce you to a topic. Um, it's called sub idol and I'm going to give you these and then I'll, I'll give you an understanding of what a sub idol is. So if you're taking notes, right, common sub idols, common modern day sub idols or common sub idols today. If you give me a hold of my nose. That means that I'm dealing with an allergy or what have you. That's trying to come forth and we rebuke it, but common modern day idol, sub idols. I want you to write sub idol and it's going to bless you. Number one, fear. Fear is a sub idol. Fear. You know, there's fear of God, which is reverence of God. It means I can acknowledge. So there's healthy fear. There's a good counter fear, right? Healthy fear tells me not to go close to that alligator and pet it like a puppy. Okay. That's healthy fear. That's I acknowledge that you you are a, you are an alligator. And that to, to you, I look like dinner. I acknowledge that, and you know what? I'm going to give you respect. That's all it is, is respect. That's all it is, is respect. There is healthy fear, then there's debilitating fear. Debilitating fear is typically when you get into the idolatry part, whereas, like, we, me and my students, we go on a cruise um, every year. Well, we go, we travel somewhere every year. Last year was the first time we went on a cruise. We're going on another cruise this year, right? Every year we go on a cruise, we do something, or what have you. When we get on the cruise ship, some of the students, I noticed that uh, this was their first time last year, some of the students had just a fear, moderate fear of water. So it's quite natural. Fear comes from, one of y'all's daughters, thank you, God bless you, beautiful. Fear comes from ignorance. And ignorance doesn't mean stupidity. It means that information, it comes from the word ignore. Information is present, but you chose not to study it out. You chose to ignore it. So there's information about cruising. There's information about waters and things. You, you, and so you, you never thought to study that kind of stuff out. So when you get on there, you're left to deal with the image in your head, the image of the Titanic, which is the last thing you saw about a cruise ship. You're left to deal with the image of the Titanic, the movie you watch or what have you. You're left to deal with the thought of drowning in the sea, becoming shark food, you know, becoming shark dung in the middle of the ocean or what have you. You're left to deal with that image. So I, I noticed some of them that had fear. And then I noticed a um, couple that had terror. That, that that means it was debilitating. You know, and they weren't so uh, terrified of the ship. They got on the ship or what have you. But it was uh, debilitating to the point where when we went to the rail to kind of look over into the water, you know, we had some of them. They was like the ones that had fear. They were like, uh -huh. but then I was able to say, hey, get up, push past it, push past it. Just come look. Because these rails are secure. You ain't got to, but you can trust the most high God. And they got up and they looked. 
debilitating fear or terror, they couldn't, I, I, I wasn't pushing them out their seat beyond that. Because once I started seeing the, like an attitude, like if you get upset or you get aggressive, that's debilitating fear. That's when the fear has become an idol. That's when the fear is, is controlling you at this point. It's controlling your decisions or what have you. And whenever I saw that, one of the things I learned to do is now let's try to downgrade that to fear. Let's try to downgrade that from terror to fear rather than me trying to just say, come out here and do this. One thing I can honestly say, and we'll get back into this. The ones who dealt with uh, fear, moderate fear, got delivered from it. They got delivered from it. They came to the thing. They looked over the edge. I said, you're going to feel the discomfort. Let yourself feel it. You know, I feel the discomfort. I said, I, I, I can't swim. Oh, what have you? So <laughs> feel the fear. Oh, what have you? Feel it, but don't let it control you. Because if it's not controlling you, it's nothing but an emotion. Do me a favor. Be sure to like and share this, guys. Be sure. It's nothing but an emotion at this point. But don't, don't, don't obey it. But the ones who had terror, it was that we were able to, the objective was to get it into a fear. Okay, come up the stairs. Come try this anyhow or what have you. But then go back down. Go back down or what have you. So that's how you start dealing with sub items. But fear. Fear is a sub item. Number two, emotions. Majority of you, the problem that you have is that how you feel matters most to you. How God feels falls second to how you feel. For how God feels, what God wants, God's plans falls second to how you feel. That is the greatest idol or sub idol today is emotions. Most people sit back and they, every time you look around, they're trying to, and we're going to deal with this. They're trying to get back to a feeling or they're trying to arrive at a feeling. Everything that we do is centered around a feeling. I, I, I want I want to feel this way. I don't want to feel this way, but emotions. Number three, relational. Relational. You can put marriage or being in a relationship. We're dealing with the Eros side of uh, relational. There are different sides of relational, but we're dealing with the Eros side. Some of you, you're not... I don't even think marriage is an idol for a lot of people. I think the wedding is. And I don't even think the wedding is so much. The, it's more of a sub idol. I think being in front of people and finally ce being celebrated, publicly celebrated, being the center of attention is the biggest issue. Because you don't hear men who idolize about a wedding. Men pretty much will want to take you to the courthouse if you let them. <laughs> Most men will take your tail to a courthouse and, hey, we can get buried in the backyard, okay? In front of shark infested water. I don't give uh, three rats feathers. We can go out here and do it. They, most of the time, they don't care. It's us that push for the wedding. And a lot of times, you can tell when a woman, um, Minette, thank you. God bless you. God bless you. You can tell when a woman, you know, idolizes the wedding because she spends so much effort and time and, and, and money and she's taking out loans. Sorry. I gotta say this. The dumbest, most asinine, stupid, foolish, ignorant thing that you could do is put yourself in debt for a wedding. Put yourself in debt just so you can have pictures and memories. And then turn around and get married and you ignoring the man. He over there on the bed, laying there, you know, <laughs> and the sun and rolls over there. And you're like, I'll be there in a minute. And you're going through your picture. They just sent the pictures back. And you're going through your pictures. You're going through your pictures. Oh, I like this shot of me. She I don't know why she got this angle. I told her not to get that angle. You know, I got a double chin. I told her, don't come from underneath me. I told her, you know, catch me like this. <laughs> catch me like this. I look more childlike. <laughs> catch me like that. But relational idols the problem is you think marriage or you think relationships is going to bring you into a certain reality it only doubles down on the reality that you have i have been married twice i can say this as a fact it only doubles down on your reality if you're miserable now you'll be double miserable when you get married if you think you're horny now you'll be incredibly horny when you get married if you think for it, if you think that you're going to get married and it's going to be sex, 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 sex all day. No, you're dealing with the will of another human being who may not necessarily have that same 
Yeah, he may not, trust me, he may not have that same, what is, what is the word I'm looking for? What is the word I'm looking for? He may not have that same sexual appetite as you. Because your sexual appetite comes from how you feel that sex is att attached to, low, uh, uh, to, to, to love. You feel like sex is attached to love. Him, on the other hand, he likes having sex. But he, he had sex with you yesterday, today. He ain't trying to go three, four, five, six times a day. But see, you didn't got used so much in your life and the guys are trying to pound you up as much as they can. And so it's weird to you that you got a man up in there that can watch you walk by him but naked. And he can continue to um, watch the game. Stamina. Thank you. That's what I'm looking for. Stamina. You keep looking for a, you keep looking for something in marriage that you're not going to find. I have to say this to women because most divorces are filed by women. You keep looking for something in marriage that you're not going to find. You're supposed to find happiness and contentment outside of the man. That way, by the time the man comes, you can look at him and say, you ain't the one because you don't add to what I already have. Matter of fact, I feel like you're a deficit to that and I can't afford you. I'm not willing. You, you're expensive. The Bible says before I build a thing, count the cost. And I see right now you're going to cost me a lot. So I'm not going to fool with you. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fool with you unless you got a vision. I see you've been building. I see that you got something going for yourself. Most of the time, you it's, it's, it's um your imagination. All right, let's move on from there. Number four, common idol, common sub idols today. The opinions of mankind. The opinions of mankind. You care too much about how people feel and what people think of you. You care too much about what people think, how they feel, what they say about you, their faces. If somebody turns and looks at you like this, you feel some type of way. You take that thing home. Why she look like that? I, ain't, I was just playing. That's why I don't play with people. They people making me feel. You care too much about what people think. Instead of sitting up there, and she, they, they, instead of you just like, why are you looking like that? Now I'm just saying, wait, I'm just saying, why are you looking like that? Instead, you take that stuff home and let it control you. I ain't gonna, I'm not going nowhere else. I just, I don't like how people make me feel. It ain't people. It's the fact that you don't know the proper response. Who needed to hear that? It ain't people. The problem is you don't know how to respond properly. You don't know how to deal with discomfort and awkwardness. You don't know how to get past those moments. And what it does is anytime you find yourself in an awkward moment, it exposes that part of you that has not been developed yet. It exposes that part of you that is insecure. It exposes that. And so now you're like, girl, I'm going to go home. Rather than sitting up there and owning the moment, even if you miss it in a moment, go back and hey, girl, hey, whoop, you gave me some kind of weird look. What was up? Was you good? You straight? Oh, girl, now I was just, you know, you said this. Okay, let's clear it up. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Because what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm not I'm I'm not going to be afraid of this right here. Men in their faces. That face is going to go in the ground one day. So I'm not going to be a mad or bothered by all of these, ex these expressions or manifestations of the face. Sometimes the, better thing, the best thing to do is to ask questions instead of internalizing. Instead of internalizing. Oh my gosh, I don't, I feel real bad. Oh gosh. You, you think that she... You think she mad at me? Why do you care? All right. The opinions of mankind. That becomes an idol. That's a sub idol. We're going to talk about sub idols, guys. Family. Family. You still letting the matriarch of your family, who's Jezebel who controls your family, control you. Because in order for you to be invited to the barbecue, the Christmas party, the reunion, 
you know, in order for you to be invited to the Sunday dinners and stuff like that, you got to fall in line. You got to fall in line. I, I know that's a Mississippi thing. I'm pretty sure that's everywhere where, where people are. Family. Family can become an idol to the point where you destroy marriage because your family's not feeling your husband. Your husband got the audacity to be in love with his own self or be in love with God, be in love with peace. He got the audacity. And he's not trying to be a baby. I know she just don't, don't, don't say that. That's just how she is. That's just how she is. She'll give you the shirt off her back. Y'all always say that about Jezebel. Y'all always say that about Jezebel. She'll give you the shirt off her back. And If she gonna give me the shirt off of, off of her back, and at the same time give me some abuse, why? Okay, can I ask a question? <laughs> I'm gonna ask a question to every person on here, and I, I, I just for everybody that want to ask answer. If, if you've seen this or what have you, at least, what sense does it make for you to tell me to stay a part of a family and to give in to an abusive patriarch, mother, grandmother, great grandmother, auntie? It doesn't matter. Great aunt, it doesn't matter. Why would you tell me to deal with her abuse? Because she'll give you the shut off her back and you just know how that she, that's how she is. But you'll turn around and tell me to leave a man that's doing the same thing. Make it make sense to me, please. Why would you tell me that somebody that I'm sleeping with, maybe married to, why would you tell me to leave him for doing the same thing that she did? See, ain't nobody answering me. Why would you tell me? I'm trying to show you the hypocrisy. Why would you tell me that she could be abusive? She could be condescending. She could do a lot of little crazy stuff. And I'm supposed to deal with it because that's just how she is. Because she got one foot in the grave. But if I got a man that's doing the same thing, you need to leave him. You need to leave him, right? Culture. It's that it's it's familial idolatry, whereas you're expected in in many families to make the, your family your god, your man, and your wife. They supposed to fall second to your family. That's why they say dumb stuff like blood is thicker than water. Blood is thicker than water. In other words, if you're not blood related, we're more important than you. So if I'm married, I'm supposed to beg, don't do that. Familial. Common sub idols, number six, financial. Love of money. It's not money, it's the love of money. You got to get that together. Love of money. Money is not the problem. And y'all got to get, listen, I, I've said this before. Um, I remember man, I got posting this to Facebook. I don't remember this dude's name. And he posted to Facebook some years ago. He said, if you're offended with money, you ain't got to ever worry about having it. If you are offended with money, you ain't ever got to worry about having it. But financial, I'm talking about the love of money. That becomes a God. It becomes a God. It's what you're willing to do anything. You're willing to deceive. You're willing to compromise. You're willing to do anything just so you can get your hand on a different income bracket. When you're willing to go out there and have sex because you're making fourteen dollars an hour, but you met a man who's making seventeen dollars an hour with three dollars more than you, and now he look like a baller shot caller to you because he got a title in his job and he's making three dollars more than you. So you're willing to give up your body, even though you're a Christian and you say you love the Lord, but you're willing to give up your body because you figured that his seventeen dollars an hour plus your fourteen dollars an hour equals thirty one dollars an hour, which means that you will have a better life and life will be good for you. Plus, he look good. So you're willing to sin against God and you think that your sin against God is temporary. I'm going to sleep with him for a little while, but we're going to get married. And then once we get married, I can go back to, you know, I can go back and repent. And when, I, when, you, when people think like that, that shows me that you genuinely don't know what repentance is. You genuinely don't know what repentance is. Repentance is not saying I'm sorry. Okay, uh, let me make it sense. Let me make it like this. Man goes out there, cheats on you. You're married to the dude. And you sit up there and you're telling him, he's like, you like, babe, listen, 
you're going to keep doing this until you've gone out here. I don't know what it is about you, but it's almost like you feel like you want to go have a child with somebody. Like, you you, you know, and I, I've told you, hey, you know, let, let, let's talk about children. Let's do this, what have you. But I feel like you're not going to stop until you go and you have a child or you go, you you attain some type of benefit from it, right? You attain some type of benefit. Y'all fight, he argues or what have you, getting ready to break it off of him. He begs you to stay. And the next thing you know, you stick it out with him. He, he ends up getting a, his side chick pregnant. And now he's ready to chill. Now he, he's like, I ain't going to cheat on you no more. But, you know, I, I, I need you to let my child come to your house, to, the, to our house. I ain't going to cheat on you no more. I'm good now. I got what I wanted. Do you, would you stick with him? I'm, I'm just a question. Just a question. Would you stick with him? Most people will say no. I can wait for your nose to come in. You're not going to stick with him because he put his happiness over yours. Now that you had to be miserable, embarrassed, and now you got to deal with looking at this child every day that he went and created. Now he got the audacity to want to be faithful. Now he got the audacity to want to be faithful. No. And nine times out of 10, you'll be. And so this is what God is saying. You're too busy trying to go get what you want. You're too busy trying to get what you want from the enemy. And now once you get in, you get married and all of that, you get married. Now you want to suddenly be like, okay, God, now here I am. And God is saying your repentance isn't real. Because if I rip that man out of, if I rip that man out of your hand, you go back and do it again. Repentance means to turn from the sin. That means I won't do it again. I won't do it again, regardless of the situation. If my getting delivered from fornication was the fact that the man who I was fornicating with put a ring on my finger nine times out of ten. I didn't get delivered from fornication. So if something happens where that relationship falls apart and this guy kicks the bucket all the way to heaven, if something happens where we're no longer together and another man comes along nine times out of ten, guess what's going to happen? So it wasn't true repentance. This is what I told you. You could be a married fornicator. You could be a celibate fornicator. It's all you trying to manipulate the most high God. You can be married and have fornication. That means you're still in agreement with fornication. You haven't fallen out of agreement with fornication. It's just that now you're married. So now that thing is still in your heart. God wants to deliver it from your heart to the point where you are in agreement with him. This is when you begin to walk with him. He says, can two walk together except they be agreed? If something happens where you no longer have the man, will your clay, your legs still be closed? Or is it when somebody, another man come along, you're going to pull that same game again. You're going to be rolling around on him, doing all the stuff to him, trying to hurry up and get him to marry you. And then he don't marry you. Now you're on the next dude, what have you. And you decline. And next thing you know, you over here at a courthouse getting married to him. You're at a, you're at a courthouse getting married to him. And now you think you're manipulating. Okay, guy. That means I didn't put God first. I put me first. That's idolatry. That's making God ride shotgun. That's idolatry. That's me saying, okay, I got the man. We have the kid. Now, I'm going to bring my idol back to church with me. And we're going to worship you. And God is like, you do know that I see your heart. Your heart on judgment day will testify against you. I don't think people know that. Your heart is going to testify against you. This is the black box of your soul. That thing is going to be the one that open up. When you're trying to control it with your intellect, when you're trying to say, when you're wanting to say, God, it wasn't like that. Your heart going to say, yeah, you want first. Nope. I wanted a man more than I wanted you. I wanted a feeling more than I wanted you. I wanted you only because I wanted to come to heaven. But I didn't understand you. I didn't pursue you. I didn't study your word out. I wasn't that interested in you. Your heart will testify against you. All I wanted was you uh, to, to let me into your house. I wanted you to be my sugar daddy. I wanted you to let me into your house. I wanted you to bless me. I wanted you to give me the desires of my heart. I wanted to use you as a pit bull against my enemies. I wanted to use you. I wanted to take advantage of you. But I didn't want to get to know you. It's the reason why I complained about going to church, which is the reason why I kept my booty in a seat in the congregation. I wasn't trying to get up and serve. You know, the Bible says the greatest amongst you is to serve. I wasn't trying to serve. Why would I serve? Me being Christian, isn't that enough? 
Your heart will testify against you. This is why you want to address, you take inventory of what's in here. So you go before God and say, God, I'm not going to lie. I don't feel like I want to serve you like I should. And I don't like this feeling. Please deliver me. Deliver me. Give me a revelation of you. I don't want to be this way. Instead of saying, God, I glorify your name. You my every you, you you number one in my life, and then God takes your number one away, and you like you gonna take this, you gonna let him have it. And God said, "Wait, I thought I was number one." But love of money, the Bible says, the, the root of all evil is the root of all evil. So it's not there's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with making money, earning money. And trying to have enough where you can take care of you, your family, and be a blessing. All it's nothing wrong with being rich. Nothing wrong with none of that. So don't get it twisted. I always say people who love money are typically the ones who don't have it. Those are the ones that are lie, lie still, cheat, and do whatever they can to get to it. How do I know? Because I grew up in poverty. But it's the love of money. Common sub idols today, number seven. Number eight. Number seven. Number seven. Number seven. Heaven. Heaven. Y'all need to listen to this in its in its entirety. Heaven. Most believers don't want God, they want heaven. They want to go to heaven. They just don't want to go to hell. The thought of going to hell for eternity and burning in a, a lake of fire and sulfur and all of that stuff, you know, brimstone, the smoke of the torment rising forever. It's just not a sexy feeling. Not a good, you know, not a good feeling. So most of the times the problem that we that we have is that we're not looking at God. We're looking past him into his house. It's like coming to somebody's door, looking in their house, and then you manipulate the man at the door because you want to get into his house. You manipulate the man at the door because you want to get into his house, and God looks at you and he's like, okay, so I'm going to see if you want me. Because if you want me, you're going to keep my commandments. If you want me, you're not, it's not going to be a hard thing. You're going to be studying me. You're going to pursue me. You're going to, you're going to do whatever you can to please me if you want me. But if you just want my house, you're going to have a different attitude. If you just want my house, you're like, God, I got to do that. So it becomes works. All right, I got to keep my legs closed. But the whole time you keep your legs closed, you put your hands down there. That means you haven't surrendered. You want to go in his house, but you don't want him. People idolize heaven. They want the golden streets. They want uh, everything that they think that heaven is. They don't want God. They want his house. Number eight, the host of heaven. People idolize the host of heaven. These are the suns and moons and stars. This be your zodiac. Girl, you a Pisces? I'm this, I'm that. That is a form of self-worship. You, you end up praising the host of heaven, trying to look to them for your identity, for your personality, for uh, um, any indication as to who you are. Any indication as to who you are. I'm just trying to look and see. Because the problem with the human is that you keep looking for mirrors. Right? You keep looking for mirrors. You keep looking for somebody or something to kind of reflect back and say, this is who you are. This is why you got anger issues. <gasps> I got anger issues because I got no. You got anger issues because you need deliverance. You got anger issues because you don't have revelation. You have anger issues because you haven't surrendered yourself wholeheartedly to God. You have anger issues because you have an idol that God is playing tug of war with. Mm -mm. They said Aquarius, girl. They said we got that. Every demon or every zodiac sign is the name of a demon. And every night one of those demons have other demons under it. it. They're groupings of demons. And so all of this, when you say Aquarius, there are demons that you're going to have. And they're going to bring those personality traits to you. The demon of anger, the demon of pride, the demon of rebellion, the demon of vengeance. And now you pick up all those spirits. And now you see other people who call themselves Aquarius. And you're like, you're Aquarius too? It's a demon. That you come into agreement with, which is why it has a legal right to walk with you. Amos 3 3. It has a legal right to walk with you because you've invited it in. The hosts of heaven are sub idols. Number nine, our reputations. How people see us 
we, we, we make the world out of that. I know that my mom, when we were growing up, my mom, her reputation was so important to her. How people saw her was so important to her. And it was so aggravating to me and my siblings, which is one of the reasons why we were your traditional children that would just kind of act out. And, you know, we'd do stuff that I won't say we would embarrass my mom, but we would play with her issue. We would play with her issue. Like we out in public, my brother would come up to uh, come up, you know, what have you, like we're in the store or what have you. My mom, you know, she was real soft spoken. Yeah, hey, go over there and do that. That's literally how her voice was. Yeah, um, have you seen this? Go, no, don't do that. Okay. So my mom had this really soft Mickey Mouse type voice, and her demeanor was the same. She was very mousy and quiet and sweet, or what have you. And she cared a lot about what people thought about her. So let's say, for example, we were in in a store, or what have you. My brother would do something like, hey, mom, mom, can I get this for the diarrhea? You know, you know, I got diarrhea, mom, can I get this? And she'd be like, she'd look both ways and she'd be like, trying to give him a look, trying to give him a look at what happened. We played with her issue. We played with her issue. It's typically what children do, when typical children would find your issue, they would play with it. But that was her, her thing was she idolized her reputation. When we got older and I, I, I talked with her about that and I was telling her, I said, you care too much about what people think about you. Why? Because I've never, I've never, it never made sense to me. I used to tell her when I was young because she used to idolize some of my uh, relatives and stuff like that. Like she idolized how they felt. And I said, I remember being a teenager and saying this to my mom. I remember being a young lady and saying this to my mom, probably 12, 12 years old. I said, you care about people who don't even like you. You care about folks and what they think about you. And they don't even like you. And I'm telling you, this to some of y'all. A lot of y'all, y'all care about what, what people think about you. People who don't like you, who have no bearing on your bills, people who uh, people who ain't thinking about you on any given day, and you care how they feel. You made their emotions, you made their, their view of you into an idol. You care, you embarrass me. If I ever get to my, if I ever get to a space where I feel like if I make a mistake in front of you, that I'm going to be embarrassed, I will intentionally embarrass myself in front of you until that thing break. Because I don't want that, I don't want that emotion or that belief to have that type of power over me. I will sit there and tell you, girl, I am sitting here with, with some crazy gas, trying not to blow that wig clean off your head. I will embarrass myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to go over here. My um, sister in Christ, she comes over whenever she has to do my hair. I, I told her, I said, listen, girl, my stomach hurt. I'm sorry. I'll go over here out of courtesy. What I'm saying is this. You be courteous. Use tact, use wisdom. Know your tables. Know when, when to do a thing and when not to do a thing. But idolizing how somebody feels about you gives that person a measure of control over you. Idolizing how a person feels about you. And I, I'll say this, uh, and it, I just think about immediately when it comes to marriage, because women, we do that when we get married, we be too busy trying to be cute for the dude. I don't want to party in front of him. I don't want to do this in front of him. I told y'all I had that time when I got married. I would do that for about probably three business days. Um, I was too big. I had some major gas one time and I'm sitting up there and I'm fighting off the gas. I'm just like, mm -mm. and we were staying, living in Germany, staying in this little bungalow type apartment. And um, I'm sitting up over there and I'm caring about the, how he felt. And I ended up with gas entrapment. Worst feeling in the world, man. You talk about some, I was crying for three days. I had gas entrapment. I got delivered on the third, third day or no, maybe the second day. Because we had the, the bedroom was like a bungalow type apartment. The uh, bed, you had to go up this ladder, not steps, but ladder. And it was like this little bungalow at the top. And what happened? I remember he went up there and I, I could look up at him. And I'm at the computer. And this joker lift up his leg and let out a horn. Ah, I'm sitting here looking like you over here worried about how he feels, trying to be ladylike. What is that even way? But trying to be ladylike, you're trying to be all of that stuff, caring about how he feel, 
And he up there, he don't even care. Dude was a loose in front of me. I said, bet. <laughs> I said, when this stuff come down, I ain't doing that no more. When it came down, I was, uh, and he was like, baby, I've never seen a woman fight before. I said, welcome to America. <laughs> we were in Germany, but I told him, welcome to America. But I said, welcome to America. Uh, for the rest of our marriage, he said that pretty much anytime I had gas, he said, you know, it is which I've never seen a woman fight. I've never seen a woman fight. And I said, well, you have now. Your testimony changed. Because what I did was I said, I'm not, if I'm going to live with him for the rest of my life, I am not dealing with no gas and trauma. I'm not dying so that he can feel like I am a perfect creature who never emits a foul odor. No. That's your own personal thing. Do what you do what you want. All right. Hmm. Our reputation, the last one is number 10. Comma sub idol, power. A lot of things center themselves around power or your desire to have power. I don't know why this thing doesn't seem to be focusing to me, but it, it, it centers itself around power or your desire to have power, your desire to have power. All right, let's move on. I want to give you some facts. Give you some facts. Genuine poop. Listen, I'm telling you, if you will fart in front of your husband, raise your hand. Right? Give me a hand up, Imogen. If you won't, put the hands down. Put your finger down. Do the, the thumbs down. Let's have a little bit of fun. You will fight in front of your spouse to the men of God. I know the men of God. I don't care. Men will do it in front of you. I'm sorry. There is no man of God you're going to meet that's going to try to hold it in. Okay? There's no man of God that you're going to meet and that's going to try to hold it in. Okay? Praise the Lord. We got some pooters up in here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's how you be free. That's how your marriage lasts. Okay? Your marriage lasts when you can sit back and be yourself. Is not trying to show yourself as perfect. And let me tell you something. A lot of the women, I see everybody with their hands up or what have you. There are some people in there that probably they're not knowing how to feel. And they never really thought about that. And they probably would have put their hands down. But you're helping them to get free right now. You're helping them to get free right now to come to understand. I see a few of you with thumbs down or what have you. But um, trust me, you get married. In many cases, you will get free from that. Because that gas will come at the most inopportune time. And it's not going to be where you're. You be in a car with this guy and he's driving and you're on a long drive from one state to another state. And you got a choice is to let loose or to have gas in traffic for the next three days and ruin your vacation. Sorry, let down the window, bro. I'm sorry. Let down the window. Let, let that way. Right. You'll try to make it silent, but if it's uh silent and deadly, if it's anything like that, then my nine times out of ten. We just go ahead and start issuing our warnings and stuff like that. And just so you know, he said gas prices high. I love it. But just so you know, it doesn't affect how a man, it doesn't change how a man feels about you guys. Um, the the desire or the the temptation to try to look perfect will actually make it where he doesn't feel so safe around you. So you want to feel safe. I'm not telling you that you need to go and start busting in front of your dudes. Go with your own belief or what have you. But I am saying. That realistically speaking, if you're going to be married for the long haul, you're human, right? Your, your, your husband is going to see some bodily function. He's going to see some things. He may even have to do something to help. It, it gets, okay, when you marry, it's not always. He's going to see the worst side of you, okay? He's going to see the worst side of you. You may see the worst side of him. If you have a baby, he's going to have to try to help you, you know, throughout that, you know, the bleeding, all that. He's going to see stuff that you didn't want a man to see, all right? So facts. Number one, every sub idol has a main idol. Now let's let's deal with the sub idol thing because I know we talked about sub idol. The main idol is always, and I think we're gonna get into that. Number two, yeah, the main idol. Number two, the main idol. My main idol is always self. So I'm gonna bring all these together. Uh, so every sub idol has a main idol. The main idol is self. So we talked about sub idols, which were fear, emotions, marriage, the opinions of man, family, financial, heaven, the host of heaven our reputations and power. These are sub idols, but they all have a main idol. Every last one of them are streams that lead to one idol and the idol that it always leads to is self. Selfishness, self-worship, or what have you. The main idol, number two, is always self. So number one, some facts you should consider. Every sub idol has a main idol. Every sub idol has a main idol. Number two, the main idol is always self. The main idol is always 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 self always self another word for self worship is sin 
And another word for self-worship is narcissism. Do we have any uh, moderators on here? I don't think we have any moderators on here tonight. All right. Another word, another word for self-worship is sin. Another word for sin or self-worship is narcissism. I've told you guys this before. Every person is, has narcissistic tendencies. Every human being, it just deals with selfishness. That's all it is. The more selfish you are, the more narcissistic you are until it gets to the middle of that spectrum where you start dealing with the disorder. Once you go past the disorder, you start dealing with the uh, demon and you're uh, moving not just into the demon, but you're, you're moving into the principality of it. When you get into the principality, you're dealing with somebody who is a narcissist rather than somebody who's narcissistic. So there's a difference between being narcissistic versus being a narcissist. There's a difference between being narcissistic. So every human, I've, I've drawn out the spectrum before, there's a spectrum of narcissism. Children, for example, are most of the time when they're born, they're on the other side of the spectrum, right? Where they're more narcissistic than anything. But the thing is, you take them on this journey. As a matter of fact, you can measure their mental health based on them becoming less narcissistic. So I always talk about, for example, if you have a bag of chips and your kid, you get his child, this big bag of chips, you holding this little one-year-old, he holding a big old giant bag of chips, bag bigger than him. And he eat and you, you sit up there and say, can I have a chip? Mm -hmm. Selfishness, right? Mm -hmm. I bought that for you. But he's a kid. He doesn't know any better, so that's okay. We measure it when he take that bag, that chip out the bag and he put it in our mouth. And that, that when he finally take a chip, he put that shows us that he's growing. He put it in our mouth. And so in the beginning, what we do is we mumble like, mm, 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 good. Mm. But over the course of time, you bite into that chip because he got more. Over the course of time, and in the beginning, yeah, you just put that in my mouth. But you tell him, stop that. Stop that. You can't be selfish. You know, you got more chips in that bag. Slowly but surely, he puts it in your mouth and you eat it. He goes, <laughs> that's signs of development, right? And so he comes from this side of the spectrum where he's incredibly narcissistic. And he comes over here where he becomes moderately narcissistic or better yet, normal. What we call normal is normal narcissism. What we call normal in the United States is just normal narcissism. Realistically speaking, and the United States is becoming even more narcissistic. We are more narcissistic than most nations. France and the United States have a reputation throughout the world of being narcissistic or being um, self-centered, prideful, arrogant, all of that stuff. OK, we have a reputation throughout the throughout the world. The uh, guy that came out, I had a new security system installed in my house the other day. I got rid of Xfinity, um, even though don't joke, still trying to give me trouble. Uh, but. I got rid of Xfinity. So I got a new uh, security system installed in my house. And the guy came out super nice. He was from, I think he said Antigua, Antigua, or what have you. And he was like, yeah, I don't, you know, we were talking and laughing. And he said, no, I don't want to be, you know, offensive. But, you know, like, I said, you can see it. America, we are. We're self-centered. We're known throughout the world for being, we are known throughout the world for being, like, spoiled. We're known throughout the world for crying over stuff that don't matter. We're known throughout the world for when we come into another country, a lot of times we bring our American ways with us. We're known, through, we're known throughout the world. America's known for that and France is known for that. These are the two countries that are known for that. But every sub idol has a main idol. The main idol is always self. So fear based on self. I don't want something that hurt me. Your emotions, I think they're making me happy. They make me sad. They make me bad. They make me this. Marriage is based on what I want from it and how it's going to make me feel. The opinions of man, how they made me feel. You see, everything goes back to emotions, which all go back to self. Everything, right? Gaslighting in the United States is normal. Everything associated with narcissism in the United States is normal. So when we call somebody narcissistic, in many cases, they're psychopathic. You know, they've already crossed over. When we call somebody in the United States uh, narcissistic, they, they're they over in the range of psychopathy, right? They, they're not, they're just, I mean, they're, they're even more narcissistic than our country. I has a tendency to be another word for self-worship is sin. And another word for self-worship is narcissism. Remember we have a spectrum of narcissism. Most of us are on it or all of us are on that spectrum, but most of us are on the side that says normal, 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 uh, narcissism, normal self-worship or what have you. Meaning we have some self-control, uh, meaning that we, we've kind of come to learn that, Hey, if I want it, I got to work for it. 
If I want it, I got to wait for it. I got to heal. There's a lot of things. So we've come to understand those things. So understanding keeps us grounded. But when you have people that don't understand, then you start noticing that they move over more toward, you know, more narcissistic. And then you get to the, me the middle again. That's when it becomes a disorder. That's when it becomes a disorder. Once you get to the middle of it, that means that this person has, they're just way too self-centered. They have this, they have the self-centeredness of a toddler. And you know, they throw tantrums, they're manipulative. It's all about control, it's all about getting what they want. And then once you move past that spectrum, you're not you're going past, you've gone beyond disorder. Now you're dealing with it, you know, more spiritual. Once you go past that middle, it's more it goes beyond a disorder. Now you're going into not just a demon, but you're going into legalities and stuff like that. And once you get to the far side of it, that's when you've been turned over to a reprobate mind. Again, we're talking natural to spiritual. Um, you, now you're dealing with a reprobate mind, somebody that God has rejected because that person that constantly rejects God. That person constantly rejects God. Number four, every human being is narcissistic. We just got to dealing with that. Every human being is narcissistic. There's a spectrum, a spectrum of narcissism. But what your objective as a believer is to go over here to be moderate. As moderate as possible, that means you're selfless. You do that through selflessness, through giving, through showing up, through volunteering, you know, putting yourself on a back burner. That's why God said the greatest amongst you shall serve. The greatest among you shall serve. So you do that by doing those type of things. You are overcoming self, right? Because self wants to always go get the cookie, the ice cream, watch TV. And self wants to say, let me call this guy back. Tell him he can come to my house. Self says, I want to do, you know, everything that appeals to my flesh, everything that appeases my flesh. But selflessness says I'm choosing God over self, even though the desire is there, I'm ignoring the desire, I'm rebuking the desire and I'm replacing it with the word. And at the same time, I'm being a blessing to other people. I'm totally putting myself. So that is right. Humility. That is when you humble yourself. Number four, every human being is narcissistic. Number five, self-worship, which we said, what is, what is another word for self-worship is sin or narcissism. Self-worship or idolatry has a temperature. The colder your heart is, the more demons you'll have or the greater rank of the demons you'll have. Let me say that again. Self-worship or idolatry has a temperature. Well, as you go on that, temp on, on that spectrum, it gets colder and colder. The more you away from God, the more away you go from normal. And you, the more you go over here, the colder and colder you get. The colder you get, the more demons you're going to have and the greater rank of spirits that you're going to have. The greater rank. Y'all got to hear this. Not every Jezebel spirit has the same rank. You can put four people in front of me, two women, two men, and they can all have a Jezebel spirit. And every last one of them going to have a Jezebel spirit that has a measure of rank. Now, I may cast, you know, take this girl through deliverance from Jezebel. And she manifests and Jezebel comes right on out. Now, when you're dealing with Jezebel, you're going to have to deal with the vibes and some other stuff, right? So I can take her through deliverance and she manifests and what have you. Because what she has doesn't have that great of rank because she hasn't she hasn't yielded herself to that spirit as much. So she's narcissistic, but she's not necessarily a narcissist. But then I can turn around and I can get over here to the other woman on the other end, or I can get to a dude on the other end. I try to take them through deliverance and they're just looking at me. Because they've yielded too much of themselves to that spirit. They've given so much of themselves. So that means that that, that spirit has more of their authority than they have. And so now we're probably dealing with a legality. So this person is not going to just need deliverance, but they need some extensive deliverance, counseling, therapy, and all of this stuff. So now we're probably dealing with the legality. So in her case, she was easy to get delivered. On this lady's case or this man's case, we may have to do some fasting and prayer. Self-worship is sin. It means when you give, give in to self, when you do what you want to do. It's almost like, I want to have this, so I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, God said, don't have sex outside of marriage, but I'm going to do it anyhow. Now, personally, I'm not. I'm just saying that's, that's an example of self-worship. Self-worship is just sin. I'm going to do, God said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Mm -mm. What about me? That's the cure to self-worship right there. Is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else be added to you. That's the cure. <laughs> but self-worship or idolatry has a temperature. The more you go over that spectrum, the colder it gets, the colder your heart becomes, the less love you have, the more likely you are to hurt yourself and to hurt others. This is when you get into the disorder. This is when you start getting into the higher, the higher ranking spirits. Again, you could put four people in front of me and I could take her through deliverance easily from Jezebel, but then I could have a guy over here 
that I can't take through deliverance as easy because his has a legality, has a legal right to him. As a legal right, he's turned over too much of his authority. He's been giving in to that spirit so much in his life. Every time he feels something, he just gives into the feeling. You know, I've noticed that whenever dealing with higher ranking spirits, uh, like high ranking spirits, what ends up happening is people have given themselves over to that spirit. So remember, idolatry is image worship, right? So they have a thought. Man driving his car, he has a thought. Hmm. It's our horny. But I don't have anybody I can call. Passed by a woman standing on the corner. Hmm. And he pulls over. He looks at her. He says, how much? Image worship. He gives in. That's somebody who has no self-control. When you see when people get to that level, most of the time, by the time you start casting demons out of them, they're going to have some high-ranking stuff in them. Because like for us, most of us, we can drive and be like, dang it. Whew, I can't wait to get married. What, the, what day is it? Oh, this is like three days after my cycle. So that's the reason I feel this way. Okay. It is what it is. Cut the music on. We're going to worship the Lord. Pat, we'll, we'll worship past the one. This It's going to go away. All right. It, it's not going to even get that deep. We, it's not going to even last with us in five minutes. We'll get past it. But some people have yielded themselves to their flesh so much that the flesh is stronger than they are. The, their flesh is stronger than their spirit. And so what they're they if this man is driving and he has a thought, dang it, I want to plow somebody. He gonna go plow somebody. If he, he if he has a thought, he may even be a heterosexual male, and he has a thought, and he see a man. That's a that's a dude. I'm gonna pretend I don't know that's a dude. I'm not gonna even ask him because he dressed like a woman. How much? And the guy looks at him and says, um, eighty bucks. And he says, okay, get in. He doesn't think anything about it. He just gives into his, his flesh. When that man shows up for deliverance, in many cases, he's going to have bezel bug. He's going to have some high-ranking stuff in him. He's going to have some stuff because he, keep, he keeps yielding himself to that spirit. Whereas those of you who don't yield as much, whenever you, you're dealing with temptation and stuff like that, you're fighting. If I take you through deliverance in many cases or anybody take you through deliverance, you're probably not going to have that great of a manifestation. You may vomit. You may shake. You may... Do what have you? You may you, but you you may be one of those people that don't do anything because you've been praying, you've been fasting, you've been you've been control having self control. Demons come in where there's no self control. You've been doing so. I can take you through the living you <sighs> And Lord says, "Tell her she's free." Well, you free, woman of God. You free. He got on the moves. Yeah, hallelujah. You free. And you're like, okay, but everybody else around me were falling and hitting the ground and shaking and convulsing and crying because they didn't have as much self-control. So it could be a generational issue, something that, that, that uh, you know, in a family, the bloodline, the demons have had so much control over them for years, over their bloodline. And so now they're having to get delivered from that. Then again, it could be they, they kept yielding to their flesh. They kept yielding. The flesh says, Man, I want some chicken and mashed potatoes. And after it's over with, I want a nice little bath. And after that's over with, I want to Netflix and chill with somebody. And they said, okay. And they gave in. And they did that repeatedly. And they end up with a bunch of uh, unclean spirits. They, they end up with a bunch of unclean spirits. So like I said, when you're taking them through deliverance, it can be a little bit more uh, lengthy because they yielded themselves to that spirit. Anytime you yield yourself to a spirit, your deliverance will typically take longer and it'll be more violence. You'll see more violence involved in the deliverance. All right, where are we? Move on to number six. Most people will never where were we? cut. Most people will never cut ties with idolatry because most people don't master self. Most people will never cut ties with idolatry because they don't master self. Self-control is the cure for idolatry. Right, it's, it's not just a cure. Putting God number one. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything else will be added to you. But you have to get to the point where you're not, a, you're not, you're no longer a slave of self. As a matter of fact, a lack of self control has everything to do with your self worship, because self worship is your flesh is gonna say, "I want this," your soul is gonna say, "I want that," and you're constantly giving into it. But most people will never cut ties with idolatry because most people don't master self. Most people will never cut ties with idolatry because they don't master self-control. They don't master. What do you do in those moments when you feel aroused and you know you're single? 
and you ain't got a prospect inside. Even if you did have a prospect, even if you did have a boyfriend and you had a girlfriend or what have you, you ain't supposed to touch them. But what do you do when you're not married? Most people never get to the point where they master self. What do you do when you're angry? How do you deal with that? I tell people, I tell people this all the time. Um, if you don't master, and I, I'm, I'm looking because I wish I had a moderator in the room, but um, if you don't master self, what ends up happening is you're constantly giving in to your demands. You're constantly giving in to how you feel. You're constantly giving in to your, your insecurities or what have you. And what that does is it creates more voids, which means that now you end up with more demons. They got more appetites and you go deeper and darker. You go deeper and darker. Let's move on. Number seven, as humans, we unwittingly create the environments for our idols that for our idols to thrive in. Right. As humans, we unwittingly create the environments for our idols to thrive in. We do that as humans. We, we create the environments that they thrive in. Um, so that means that if you have an idol, every decision you make, everything you do is going to be centered around making sure that your idol has some place that we will prepare a place for our idols. We will prepare a place for an for our idols. So if your idol is marriage, for example, if you if your sub idol is marriage, right? Because remember, all idol, all idolatry goes back to self worship. But if your sub idol is, I want a man. If if that's your sub idol, then what you'll do is you'll create an atmosphere for that. So typically, what you're going to do is you're going to surround yourself with women who are also idol worshippers who can't stop talking about girl. Did you did you see him? You saw the way he was looking at you. He was looking at me. And you're going to be one of those women that want to talk on the phone every day, all day. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I got to love you enough to tell you the truth. Because, you, because you're an idol worship. When the more idol worship you're in, the more you want to be on the phone. Tell me if I'm lying. You want to be on the phone because you want to constantly keep talking about your idol. Girl. You know the guy I told you about on my job? Who? Uh, you talking about Cockeye Craig? Yeah. Girl. How about he would got his eye fixed? He did. So we can't call him Kai Kai Craig no more. Mm -mm, girl. He got a patch over his eye now, but he said he got, you know, he had surgery and stuff like that. And he'll be able to see straight. Okay. So, you know, I remember you saying he was kind of cute. That was the only thing that was throwing you off. So what do you think? I don't know, girl, because, uh, you know, I wasn't the only one that thought he was cute. I used to flirt with him. But, you know, there's some other people on my job. I know that he's going to have a little bit more, uh, women that like him now because you know his eye gonna be straight or what have you so he gonna have more love interest now but you know i'm still trying to throw my hat in the ring or what have you even a little bit more while he got that patch on his eye what have you i flirted with him a little bit told him we got to go get some ice cream or some coffee one day and what have you he was like bet so he didn't ask you out. no he just said bet well he just said bet oh girl so what we do is we create those environments, right? We're gonna we will we will go around places that, or we we'll, we'll find ourselves doing any and everything that 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 helps us sustain that environment, because we're always creating a space for our idolatry to grow. We're always creating a space for our idolatry to grow. Number eight, you can never be truly loyal to a person or to God if you have an idol. Yes, even if that person is your sub idol. You can never be truly loyal to a person. Your friend girl that is idolized in marriage is not your friend. Baby, I learned that the hard way. That pick me. That girl that, that, that can't stop thinking, talking about, oh, girl, did you see how he looked at me? He did. Which one? The, the uh, oh, was it Kaka Craig? No. Underbite Ulysses. Oh, girl, he looked at you. Uh-huh. I don't know why that man be mean mugging, but you know, they say that's how he like, when he like a woman, he mean mugs him. They say when he don't like a woman, he smile. I don't know why he do that. He just weird. Girl, I think that man crazy. Girl, you see the way he looked at me? Everything you do will be centered around your idol. So you, somebody that's an idolatry cannot be your friend. That's not your friend. I'm sorry. Anybody that puts anything higher or more than God in a great day, not, they're not even God's friend. So they can't be your friend. They can they cannot because the minute you find that I, I tell people this all the time when I find your idol, you won't like me no more. When I find your idol, you love me in the big oh I'm, I'm 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 that Genesis person. You'll love me, but if I find your idol, 
If I find your idol, if I touch your idol, girl, what is that? Oh, what, why you got some bass in your voice all of a sudden? <laughs> I find your idol and you're going to act up. You're going to act up. I, I can't say that 100%. I have found, I have over the years come in contact with people and I find that idol and I point it out and I'm like, why do you, why is that so important to you? Why do you do that? That's what's been holding you back. That's see, that's what you've been holding. And they they, they he kind of don't thank you, Jesus. And they're going to prayer, fasting, doing what they got to do to pull that thing down, or what have you. But the average Christian knows not so much. As soon as your idol get found, you start and you start sounding like Tom Lowe. You start sounding like Barry White. You go from sounding like Mick Minnie Mouse to Barry White. <laughs> Cause somebody messing with your idol. You don't know what I've been through. Girl. Girl, listen, I was just telling you, you are better than that. God's going to bring your husband into a season. You didn't have to keep on talking to that man. That man ain't right for you. All right. Number nine, God will often be quiet whenever your idols are talking. Whenever you got a voice playing in your mind. And you're not casting that thing down. In many cases, you say, I ain't heard from God because your idols keep talking. Now, of course, we know that idols are, are deaf and they can't speak or what have you, like something I created, right? Something I created. Listen, she can't talk. And if she does start talking, I'm going to kick out of the bull in the name of Jesus. Every unclean spirit, and this thing would be burning in fire, right? But she can't talk. She can't talk. But um, God will often be quiet. If you have something in your head, like I want a man, I want a house, I want a car, I want this. If you have idols and they're constantly talking, then a lot of times you're not going to hear from God. It's not that he's not speaking. It's just that all these voices are louder than his voice. All those voices are louder than his voice in your head. But God will oftentimes be quiet until you shut those voices up. Until you sit back and say, God, I put you first. I choose you. I repent for my idolatry in the name of Jesus. I repent for generational idolatry, idolatry in the bloodline. I come out of agreement with it in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I surrender myself to you. And hear me. Don't think that as soon as you finish that prayer that you're going to hear God says, thank you. Now I can give you your next set of instructions. No, you will hear his voice in the word. You start studying that word out. And then God will start speaking to you through his word. And then slowly but surely, when you put the word down here, you'll start hearing him speak all the more because his word will align with his word. You'll start hearing him all the more. Last one, number 10. Number 10, idols reward you with an emotion. I wish I would write this in the room. Idols reward you with an emotion. Idols reward you with an emotion. This is to say that in the end of a worship encounter, your reward is oxytocin. <clears throat> Everything you do, I'm oh, sorry. I, I, we put the put it practical makes makes me. Your reward is oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, <laughs> adrenaline. That's your reward. Your reward is a feeling. You get the man. The man is a sub idol. He really hit the. The thing, right? Because you can get rid of him at some point and get another man. It's the feeling that you want. That's why we like love bombing so much. That's why we love it when somebody loves because they give us, they give us the drug of our choice. That, that, that dopamine, that oxytocin. When that man on the phone, he's saying, You are so beautiful to me. And I um I I find it difficult to stop thinking about you. It's just something about your eyes, especially your left eye. It's just something about your eyes that make me, makes me, I can't stop thinking about you. I can't stop thinking about you. And we over there and we're feeling that. It's causing that cloud nine feeling to come in. That's the problem right there. Every idol in American history roots itself in oxytocin. You be looking for a feeling. I don't want that dude. I want the feeling the dude gives me. I don't want the house. I want the house. I want the feeling the house gives me. I, I, the stuff is just, I, I want the stuff. I want the guy. Don't get me wrong. 
but I want the feeling. I, I, I want y'all to hear this. I don't, I, I'm, I'm almost feeling like some of y'all are not getting it. And I want you to get it so bad. That man that you want, you really don't care about that. You want a feeling. You've associated that feeling with the man. You don't want the crack. You want the feeling that the crack gives you. You don't want the marijuana. You want the feeling that the marijuana gives you. You don't want that gin, that Hennessy. You want the feeling. You, you don't want that gray goose, red goose, blue goose, whatever color the goose is. You don't want none of that stuff. You want the feeling. It's almost like you're a crackhead. That, that's how like the outro is. It turns you into a crackhead of sorts where you keep looking for a feeling. I just want to get high. I just want some guy to be in on my phone. I want I want to hear a deep voice, testosterone on the other end, just, just praising me and giving me a feeling. I want to get into a house with him and I want to cook and I want to clean. I want to do all that stuff. And the reward is the feeling that I get. The feeling that I'm, I'm a good wife. I cook that food to perfection. Oh, look how he looking at me. I know he's thinking, because that's how we do. We reward ourselves with thought. He, he's so happy to marry me because I can cook. <laughs> he's so happy to look at him. He, he look at him all looking happy and stomach starting to spill over his pants. Look at, look at, look at, look at him. Look how he looked at me. Baby, you got something in your beard. Then we want to go to bed and we like to hear him screaming out and it makes us feel good because it makes us feel, I know, I know what I just did to him in the bedroom. I'm probably the best thing he ever had. <laughs> Feeling. When he laid down asleep, butt naked and crusted over, I did that. <laughs> I guess I'll go make him some lunch. So, you know, for tomorrow, so when he go to work, I want to have his lunch already put together and stuff because not because I, I, I love him. Yeah, I do love him. But most of it is centered around how that makes me feel when he reaches out to me and tells me that the food that I made for him was also good. And he says, and last night, baby, I almost didn't make it to work this morning. Last night, you knocked me out. The feeling. It all goes back to self. Everything you do goes to self-worship. And God knows this about you. So what God says, the cure for that is Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I want to deliver you from the feeling, from that drug. I want to deliver you from that drug until everything that you do becomes about me. Everything you do becomes about me. Let me get to these because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a benediction when, when I, I shouldn't be giving a benediction. Everything, God says, everything you do then from that point on becomes about me. It becomes about how I feel. You put how you feel because you've lost your life. So now you found it and you found it in me. But as, other than that, you're the standard Christian where you're living for the feeling. Everything you're doing. People are going to hell for oxytocin. And oxytocin is not going to be found in hell. Oxytocin is not coming to hell for nobody. Oxytocin will evict you, right? Oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, adrenaline, every last one of those things are in the flesh. But they will they will not follow you. They won't follow you to hell. I, I, I wish y'all got that. I wish. They won't follow you. Ain't, ain't nobody having orgasms in hell. Ain't nobody, happy, ain't nobody having a happy day in hell. Ain't no happy hour. Everybody miserable and hateful. We over here addicted to a feeling. <laughs> I'm not meaning to turn you off. I'm meaning to turn you on to God. We're addicted to a feeling. And God is saying, the deliverance from that feeling comes through worshiping me. How to break the curse of my doubt. Let me give you these real quick so we can get out of here. Because we got to get We got to go. Number one, I need y'all to go to church in the morning. Okay. So this is why we got to get out of here. Number one, how to break the curse of my doubt. Recognize your ultimate desire. What is the reward? What is the reward you're seeking? So, for example, if your idol, your idol is food, what reward do you get when you put that spread out in front of you? What is the reward? It's not just eating the food. It's so good. There's a reward there. What is the reward? Identify the reward. Number two, find your altars and destroy them. What is the altar? Is it your bed? What is, your, what is the altar? Is it your kitchen table? Where is the altar? Now, I'm not telling you to get rid of your bed. If you have sex on that bed, get rid of it. 
Get your new bed. Oh, what have you? But find your altars and destroy the altars. Get rid of the altars. Get rid of the altars. Number three, discover your rituals. What is your ritual? These are your patterns. These are the patterns. So do you have a ritual every day? And this is something I was doing. You have a ritual every day where you eat, you, you, you get your food together, you get your, you get your thing ready for your TV. What is the ritual? What, where's the pattern at? Where's the pattern? Look for the pattern. Discover your rituals. Number four. I got these missed numbers, so I'm trying to make sure I pray and repent. Repent by idolatry. Pray. Talk to the Lord. Lord, set me free. I, I, I admit that I've been an idol worship. I've, I've put a feeling before you. I've put a man before you. I've put a reality, a dream, a plan before you. And I repent. And I ask that you help me. I repent. I'm turning away from it, but I can't do it alone. I need your help. Help me through the power of your Holy Spirit, God, in Jesus' name. Number five, surrender yourself wholeheartedly to God. That means don't hold yourself back. Don't sit up and tell God, I'm sorry, but then you want to give him a piece of you. I'm going to try this. No, God, whatever it is that you want me to do, I'll do it. You told me to tell the man to stop calling me, I'll tell him to stop calling me. You want me to get rid of that bed? I'm going to get rid of that bed. What is it? I'm, I surrender. I surrender. I'm not, I'm not going to fight you anymore. That was number four. Pray, pray and repent. Number five. The, 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 number five was surrender yourself wholeheartedly to God. Number six. Well, yeah, I see why I see why the numbers are off. Number six, identify your sacrifice. Identify your sacrifice. What is it that you've been sacrificing? Whether let's say eating for me, I was sacrificing my health, my good health, because I wanted the feeling. You know, whenever I had that spread of this or that in front of me, or you know, what is it that you're sacrificing? You're sacrificing your relationship with God. You know, you're sacrificing the will of God. So that you can be in the will of a human being. What is it that you're giving up to get what it is to get that reward, right? First, you're going to identify the reward. But remember, you want to identify your sacrifice as well because you got to stop giving the sacrifice. You got to stop giving the sacrifice. Number seven, get rid of the priest that walk, that work the altars. Get rid of the priest that work those altars. So now you're going to get rid of the altars. Remember, we talked about that. Now you got to get rid of the priest. These are the demons. You want to go through deliverance. Get rid of the priest. That work those altars. You do that through deliverance. That was number seven. If my number is off, please forgive me. Okay, number five was surrender yourself wholeheartedly to God. Yeah, number six was identify your sacrifices. Number seven, get rid of the priests that walk, work those altars. Number eight, go and address the trauma. Go and address the trauma. Whatever trauma, in childhood trauma, rape, molestation, neglect, uh, abandonment, uh, abuse, whatever it is, go address the trauma. You do that through therapy. Go address the trauma. Don't ignore the trauma. I tell people, I, I, I was saying this, I did a message in my message with my students last night and I was talking about, for me, I've literally had, you know, my 10 years of being single, I said I've had men that try to come my way and I was offended immediately when I saw that they hadn't put any type of work in. When they try to come into my life and it's like, you're, they're in a bad space. And I'm like, have you got therapy? I mean, I don't need therapy. So you're trying to give me that, that, that broken down raggedy version of yourself, which tells me a lot about how you see me. That tells me a lot how you see women and, or, or how you see me. You're trying to offer me something that basically that's saying to me that I'm the lowest person that you like, you're settling for me because if you really want a woman, you're going to upgrade yourself so that you could, because you're going to want to take care of her. You're going to want to provide. You're going to want to protect. You're going to want to be everything that you can. But whenever a man gets into settle mode, he'll give you that version of him that he wouldn't give to the woman that he really wants. I, you know, I'll be trying to be so brazen, but you got to tell, tell the truth. He, he'll give you that broken down version of him, that mentally disturbed I need a therapist, psychiatrist, medication, deliverance. I need a job. I need this. He'll give you that version. Baby mama drama, you know, court cases and child, uh, or child support and restraining orders. He'll give you that version of himself, but he wouldn't give that to the woman he actually wants. 
And y'all be so silly. You'll take somebody like that in and you will help him to upgrade. You will help to get him ready for the woman he really wants. Sorry. Y'all want the truth, right? You, I can't believe, girl. I put all, them, all that effort. The problem was you thought you were proving yourself by accepting him in his lowest state. No. You were showing him that you didn't think too high about yourself. He didn't go after the woman that he wanted because he felt like he wasn't good enough for her. He felt like he wasn't good enough for her. He wanted her. He felt like he wasn't good enough. That is an insult. That's an insult. He felt like for you, you would take him as is. And you take him and you cleaning him up and you tell him I love you and you handsome and you over here, you talk to your uncle about helping him to get a job and you doing all that work and you're trying to help him to upgrade. And then once he starts to upgrade, you start looking real low. Then you get, you get mad because he out here with the, the female that he wanted. You got somebody in and you raised him. And for that, he thanks you for raising up to be the man that he became. And now he out there with her. Thanks, sis. God bless you. Go address the trauma. Go address the trauma. I, I, I've said this to guys. In my 10 years of singleness, how dare you approach me like that? How dare you approach me when you need a therapist? How dare you? How dare you? Because it's, that's, that, I don't know, for me, that's an insult. But maybe because I love myself. For me, that's an insult. Because he's telling me, I don't see you as deserving of a healed, healthy, God-fearing man. That could be the three dimensions of a man. I want to teach on that song. The three dimensions of a man, the priest, the protector, and the provider. You want to offer me, you want to be a priest when you ain't even got yourself right with God. But you can't be a protector or a provider, or you want to be a protect. You want to be a protector and a priest, but you can't be a provider. No, go get yourself. Go be made whole in Christ. Go, go seek Him first, so that you can He can help you to find your wife. And if that happens to be me, you'll find me in Him. But in the meantime, in between time, get off my phone. Because what you're not going to do is offer me this raggedy dude that I got to go out here and I got to go through hell with you. The devil is a cockeyed three feather lie. I ain't doing it. All right. Go address the trauma. Number nine. Let me say this. Let me say this because I think somebody needs to hear this. One part of gaslighting, because I've, I've had this happen. You know, I, I got my, my share, I've dealt with my fair, fair share of trauma. Most annoying thing that happens is. If you're talking to a guy or to the guys, you're talking to a female. A lot of times people will gaslight you whenever you put up boundaries by trying to make you feel like the reason you're putting up those boundaries is because of your trauma. Don't don't fall for that trick. See, so you think I'm going to hurt you. I know the last man hurt you. I know you've been hurt before. I am so way past that trauma, bro. Like I got the revelation and the wisdom. I don't have the emotion, the pain or the unforgiveness associated with it. I, I've been therapized out of it. I'm good. I, I that right there is gone. But just because I have a boundary doesn't mean I'm broken. Okay. Y'all gotta be here with me. You gotta be here with me. We almost done. We almost done. We almost done. We got like two more. Two more. Just because I have a boundary doesn't mean I'm broken. Just because I have a boundary and I have a past doesn't mean that I'm broken. It means that I've learned. From, from my past. It means I learned from my brokenness. It means I learned from some stuff. I got the wisdom and the revelation. And I don't have the low self-esteem that you are accustomed to. I know that you're used to going to women and they're so happy to see somebody who's anatomically correct and they're willing to throw themselves at you and drop their drawers and everything. And they're willing to do everything and let you come sleep on their couch and they're willing to take care of you and all this other stuff. But at the end of the day, you found a different type of woman. I'm not that female. You not, I'm not going to upgrade you for the next woman. I'm not, I'm not about to help you with your mental health. I'm not about to take you through all that to help you do, so you can get ready for the next woman. I'm not going to help you just so you can get ready for the next woman. You got to recognize it for what it is. All right. 
How to break the curse of idolatry. Number nine, study to show yourself approved. Be ignorant no more. Study to show yourself approved. Stop being ignorant. Go study the word of God. Go chase God. Go make God number one. Show yourself approved. Be ignorant no more. Last one. Last one. Last one. Number 10. Give God back his place in your heart in every ounce of your life. Give God back his place in your heart and remove every false God anytime you find them. Anytime you find one. Give God back his place in your heart and remove every false God anytime you find one. And you may say, anytime I find one, yes. My journey with from idolatry, generational idolatry, is I still find idols. You know, even in this course of my life, sometimes I may come across something. I'm like, wait a minute, that's an idol. And I have to renounce it. I have to come out of agreement with it. I have to throw it and I have to break it. And I repent for it. So Alexis, thank you. God bless you. God bless you. I have to repent for it. I'm going to give you guys a way to give. I have moderators that are usually on here. Um, but I will talk to them to find out what happened. But I want to give you guys a way to give for those of you who are and don't, don't, uh -uh. I almost gave y'all the wrong way to give and somebody's going to get happy. But for those of you who want to give, you can here. All right. If you want to give, you can give. That's Cash App. Or what have you. I typically don't do that, but usually I have moderators that do that, but I don't want to rob you guys of an opportunity. If you want to give, if you don't want to give, don't send me no inbox message because that's your business. Okay. I'm not trying to prompt anybody to give, but usually um, we'll have moderators and stuff. I wanted to have the links to register for my school, but I don't have that on hand or what have you. So I'm just giving you what I do got for now. So if you want to give, you can give if this message blessed you. But the point is, last one, give God back his place. I'm trying to take this off a of highlight. Give God back his place in your heart. Give God back his place. It's his. Give God back his place in your heart and remove every false idol anytime you find one. Anytime you, anytime you find a false God, go ahead and remove that. You find out that, hey, Tiffany, I've been exalting my attitude or, you know, I've kind of relied on my money for some time. Then give God back his space. You say, God, in the area of finances, I have made money a God, the love of money or the fear of not having it. And I repent for that. Take your space. Call on his name. Jehovah Jireh, come and be my God in the area of my finances. Come and be my God. Give him back his space. Give him back his place. Give him back his, uh, and I'm trying to, let me find this link. I do want to find this link if I can. And this is for those of you, because we're going to have, we're not doing interest meetings for those of you who want to join the ministership. Uh, we're doing recordings now, but I may do, I may have, uh, I, I'm thinking I may have the students do a couple of the interest meetings. or uh, what have you. And, oh, last edit. Last submission. Alrighty. Okay, okay, okay. All right. I will say, what have we been going, have going on here? And I have some more stuff coming up, but I do want to make sure that these links that commonly go out go out. So please forgive us, thou servant. All right. I want to make sure these links that go out. Now, I want you to find the idols in your life. For those of you who want to join my mentorship program, you, you, you have to be approved for the program, but you can fill out. Um, oh, I'm just not saying, do I do I accept money orders? I don't yet because I don't have another P.O. box. I do apologize. But you can zail. You can zail. I put up zail information. I don't have another. I got to get another P.O. box. I've been thinking about getting one. I haven't made my way to the uh, post office yet. I had a girl to send me a package. Um, I had a girl to send me a package. A few months ago, and I still haven't went to get it because I don't have a P.O. box. I'm trying to see. I got three cities I can get a P.O. box in. The city I live in, the city my office is in, the city my church is in is one or the other. So I, I haven't made a decision as to what. How are you and God bless you all? Okay. I came across a prophetic video and 99% described my situation as I prayed, but now he is married to someone else. I love this question. I love this question. Um... God can say that's your husband. God can say that's your wife. However, God never removes the will of the person. If you are outside the will of God, Sassy Brown, thank you. God bless you. God bless you, beautiful. 
if you're outside the will of God, there's this thing called due season. In due season, God can release that man from you or he can release you from that man. Or the man can go into rebellion or you can go into rebellion. So God can tell you what his will is, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we will attain his will because prophecies are conditional. Most prophetic words are conditional. That means that it's just like what God will say to Israel. He will say, if you do this, then you will have the, the you have milk and honey, the, the, the good of the land, all these. But if you do that, these are the curses that will come upon you. Oh, what have you. So what happens a lot of times when it comes down to um, situations like that, Jay, thank, thank you. God bless you. God bless you. What happens in situations like that or situations like those is that the other person can go in idolatry. They can be in idolatry and they don't repent. They don't surrender themselves to God or what have you. And you may be the good thing that God would have had. But so what God would do is he will reposition you. So in many cases, what happens is that person, God will let them, he will turn them over to the thing that they want. He'll let them have the thing that they want. And God can and will re reposition you. God can and will reposition you. I don't know what that means. Don't know what that means. So yeah, God can reposition you. God can, um, he can send somebody else, right? So God will let you know what his will is. You know, his will, the, 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 his design, his plans, or what have you. But if you, let's say, for example, if God told you, I want you to fast, I want you to pray, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that, and you didn't do those things, then you didn't position yourself. And so a lot of times we think that God is waiting on us to do the stuff. And then he's like, okay, now that you did it, I reward you. That's not how he's, that's not how he's moving. What God is doing, he says, position yourself. And I'm looking for, if I have a pen over here, when God says position yourself, the way he's saying, let me see if I can use something I got up in here because I don't see a pen. I don't know why I don't just have pens over here. Let me see here because I, I draw in here a lot. I draw in here a lot. I can use one of my old drawings. Pretty, I'm pretty sure. All right. I see something I can use. I see something I can use. Give me a second. All right, we'll use this one here. We'll use this one here. Right, if he's agnostic, then that's not the will of God. So that probably wasn't God speaking. So the enemy can disguise himself as an angel of light. So that probably wasn't God speaking. Nine times out of 10, that wasn't God speaking. Even if it was what God was talking about in his will, this is what would happen if he had to surrender to him. Oh, what have you, but do not. Anybody that's agnostic, that's not the will of God. God said, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So God's word will never conflict with his word. So his, if you get a prophetic word and it goes against the written word, then you're not hearing from God. I'm going to say that again. If you get a prophetic word and it goes against the written word, then it didn't come from God. God won't send you to an agnostic man. He won't send you to an, an atheist. He won't send you to a Satanist. God will, he will always uh, give you somebody that's within his will. He will never let you be with somebody that rejected him. So the will of God, I want you to imagine here. That's, imagine you're here. Imagine this is the will of God. And God says, I need you to come up here. So God puts the man right here. He puts the blessing right here, the children, the marriage, everything right here. Your job, God's promises again, amen. He's already done. He's sitting down, right? He's chilling. He, he's, already, he's already done what he said he's going to do. It's already done. Your job is to go from here to here. Once you get there, you get to tap into what he's already done. They're online. Our mentorship is online. Most of my students are in different states. Well, all the majority of my students are in different states. So we have a virtual meeting every Wednesday night, every Wednesday at 9 p.m. We come, we go live. Um, I have a classroom of on Facebook uh, that they're in. We have a lot of programs that some of the students get into. You know, they learn coding. Some of my students, they um, just wrote their first children's book. That's in my 2.0 program or what have you. So we have a bunch of women. I'm, I've invited men into the program. But we haven't had so many men yet, so I'll have to do something for men to come in. We had one guy to come in. We had two at one time. One was inactive, and then another one came into the program, and he was in there for a minute, and then he he left us. And if you still if you still watch your brother that left us, we still love you. Okay, and I'm so sorry for the women. I'm so sorry because I know you probably felt uncomfortable. You know, I did feel like the women started taking their bonnets off because the women are required to have their cameras on. I feel like they started taking their bonnets off and they started, you know, smiling a little bit more on camera and stuff. He probably got uncomfortable looking at He was like the only dude or what have you. He's a handsome guy. So those women are probably like, hallelujah. 
How, yeah, they had to write a children's book. I showed them how to create a children's book. They had to create a children's book or what have you. Um, they created plenty of journals. They created card games. That's in my 2.0 and my 3.0 class. My 1.0 class, I got their ears. The 2.0 class, I got their hands. 3.0, I got their hearts. <laughs> As I tell them, or what have you. I'm going to answer this last question and I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get out of here. How do you know if you are, in fact, in isolation season? What does that look like? In the season of isolation? God doesn't call you necessarily to a season of isolation. I think a lot of times we think that God is telling us to get rid of people when God is really just saying, I, when he's saying get rid of people, in many, many cases, he's saying, I don't want you to be intimately attached. So I don't want you in a relationship. I may call you outside of having friends or close friends in that season. So God is not telling you to forsake the coming together of the saints. He's not telling you to go into a cave and just be by yourself. Uh, what God is in many cases telling you is that I'm calling you to a season of a dry phone. I'm calling you into a season where you're going to go places and you're not going to be seen. You go to church and people are going to say, hey, you won't say, hey, but nobody's going to really see you. No man will see you. Nobody's going to see you. And in seasons like that, God just wants time of worship. Your phone is dry. Um, you, you, ain't no man checking for you <laughs> and all of that. And this is this is the time where God wants you to seek him. He wants you to pursue him. Or what have you. So that's what that looks like. He's not calling you to go away from the church, to isolate yourself from the human race. Oh, what have you? He's not calling you to do that um, in most cases, right? He's not calling you to do that. Um, sometimes we desire to do that whenever we've been hurt, we've been disappointed, or what have you. And we'll try to merge that with whatever it is that we heard him saying. Um, because that is, you know, it, it, it's something that seems like a solution, right? If I get away from people, then I don't have to worry about people using my handles against me. When I say handles, I'm talking about my weaknesses, my insecurities. I ain't got to worry about them using those things against me, or what have you. No, the children's book doesn't come with the mentorship course. That's 2.0. I give them um, assignments in 2.0. 2.0 gets more assignments. 1.0, we I teach. And then they'll get an assignment and they don't get any hectic assignments. Uh, if I gave 1.0 some hectic assignments, a lot of them will probably run. Or what have you. 2.0 means that you genuinely want this mentorship. And that means you, you, you chasing me for real. Like you chasing me for real. That means you didn't graduated from 1.0 and now you're saying, because so, you're, you're, you're going to, you're truly called to me. So I tell ladies, um, some people are calling me, some people are not. Some people are calling me for a season. Some people are calling me for a reason. But in 2.0, you're chasing. At this point, you done went to 1.0. I done got on your nerves. You done got past all of that. You done went a year with me, and you still, you still here. They joined 2.0. And when they get to 2.0, I'm like, okay, you're not going to walk with me and be broke. You're not going to walk with me and be suffering and be dependent on... In 2.0, I'm like, I got your hands. And so I'm going to teach, I teach them how to create card games. I teach them how to do different things. We talk about different, you know, on a different level. 3.0, different. 3.0, I tell them, put, put, that means you truly do feel called to me. And uh, nine times out of 10, this isn't a seasonal thing. This is going to be something that these are going to be people that I expect, or I hope that, you know, we, we will walk together for the rest of our lives. Or what have you. It's my 3.0 class. They're getting ready to graduate in April. <laughs> Most of them are. They, this is my, my first ones. Um, they're getting ready to graduate in April, but they have free mentorship with me for the rest of their lives. After they've gotten to 3.0 and they kept going, they have three point, they have uh, free mentorship for the rest of their lives. So whatever mentorship program I have, they, they can be a part of it. So 3.0, after they graduate this year, they're going to continue with me, you know, because I'm not teaching the same thing again. Again, they're going to continue with me. However, um, It'll be free for them. It'll be free for them. Oh, what happened? So that's that. Anywho, I love you. I pray that you guys got something from this. My prayer for, for this particular lesson is that you come out of idolatry. Because I know the rewards. Me being com coming from generational idolatry myself, I know how hard it is to come out of idolatry. I know how frustrating it is because when you're coming out of idolatry, you're constantly finding different idols. Um, the thing I forgot to say, you know, I, I learned. When God dealt with me when I was I had idolized the man I was married to. And God said, you made that man an idol. And I said, Lord, I, I repent because I, I, I didn't know you could make a person an idol at that time. Um, and I started repenting. I didn't know, even after God told me that, that there was a root there. So I thought, OK, this is the problem. You make the man an idol, this, that, this, that, and the other. Uh, but the issue with, that God wanted to address in that moment, in that hour, was the fact that I was an idol to myself. How I felt 
what I wanted, my preference, my desires, all of those things. The man represented an attempt of my own to fill voids. He, he, he represented an attempt of my own to fill voids. And I told you the cure for idolatry in most cases with God is that he allows the thing that you want to constantly disappoint you. So you, you end up getting disappointed time and time and time again, time and time and time again. But anywho, I love you guys. I appreciate you. And I pray that you had, I pray that you were blessed by this lesson and join the ministry program. You want to sow a seed, sow a seed. And I'll be back on today. Might as well say officially today because it's after 12 and we will talk again. All right. I love you.